the shock week. I'm getting ready. It is 11, I don't know, 1131, 1130. I don't know. But as usual, half hour early, um, getting things ready. Appreciate everybody, um, anybody out there who's dialing in, taking a look at things. Um, I just got to get some things working here. We're going to be talking safety by design today so i'm pretty excited about it i like talking about uh, designing safety into the system as opposed to um, after the fact i get phone calls and um, after doing some educational programs i'll have people say uh, hey i like that idea how do i get that involved with my facility and the questions after the fact or uh, manufacturer space do you have? All these different things uh, come into play. So the more we can do before we get the uh, system put in place, the better off we are. Okay, well, just trying to We're going to see how many people we get today because um, I am sure there are a lot of people who are out uh, cooking on the grill and stuff like that because today's holiday. Uh, I elected to um, at least visit with you for two hours today to talk safety by design and we'll see how many, um, how many people we get uh, engaged today. These, the people that are on this call are the hardcore safety professionals out there. Uh, spend some time and talk about safety by design. Just getting my things put together. We're going to go live at uh, 12 o'clock. Well, we're live now, but I mean, we're going to have to start the program at 12 o'clock. Two hours again. And then after that two hours, I'm out of here. I'm going upstairs. I've got some stuff to do. I might go over to my brother-in-law's. I don't know where I'm going to go. But I know I am just going to take it easy. And hopefully you will too. Um, I'm going to look at my live stream. Let's see how many people. We've got two people out there. That's about it. See? Two hardcore people. See you, David. Yep. We are getting ready, but my uh, computer is pretty slow. I got to make sure that um, I don't have some things going on. I don't think so. Right, safety by design. This is gonna be good. Continuing shock week. Continuing shock week. our shock week experience you remember Jimi Hendrix had the uh, Jimi Hendrix experience well Tom Dimitrovich has the shock week experience Ooh. not quite uh, like Jimi Hendrix experience but um, you know what we're up there hey Ah, uh, no, you know what? That is not me playing, Nihad. I, um... I downloaded some thing from, uh... From, what do you call it? Um, 
YouTube has some free stuff, and I decided to at least play that while we were starting off, because I needed something in the background. Alright, so we are live. I got my post for LinkedIn ready. I got my live on Facebook ready. I got the title in to share on my timeline. Stream health looks good. Um, yep, stream health looks really good. We got me, you know, the two, the, the, the diehards here. We got Dave Engelhart, David Engelhart, and we've got Neha. David, what uh, what type of uh, weather are you getting down in Florida? Hey, Costa Rica, happy fourth. Absolutely. We got Costa Rica represented in the house. What kind of weather you got going on in Costa Rica? And what do you guys got planned for the weekend? Cooking out? I mean, what are you doing online right now? Can't hear me well? Well, let's see if we can change that. I gotta pr turn up the, turn up the volume, turn up the volume, dance, dance. All right, so I am a little weak here, aren't I? Let's move this forward a little bit. I don't know why. I don't know why sometimes I get, hold on, I'm gonna just, play with my settings a little bit so I can um, put in the reverb let me find out where I'm at so if I do this I get to do the 14 Nihad El Sharif welcome to <laughs> well, I don't know if that's that's still I'm still a little bit weak over here. Let's turn that up. Um, my gain is okay. I don't want to take turn the gain up too much. Um, let's try this one. What's this do? That doesn't do anything. That doesn't do anything this doesn't do anything man I don't know what nope oh I just <laughs> partially cloudy and rainy about 72 degrees down in Diego Coronado down in uh, Costa Rica muy bien hot and humid David Engelhart is hot and humid. Well, I am going to move the microphone a little bit. I'm going to move this a little bit closer to me because I don't know why you guys can't hear me. And even, if, man, I'm the closer. All right. I don't know. I don't know what's going on, Nihad. Uh, let's move this up. I wonder, I am going to, just looking at some of my settings on my mixer. I don't think there's anything else in my mixer that I can do. I am streaming. Hmm, I'm gonna close that. I remember yesterday, I think it was yesterday, I was weak and then all of a sudden it was strong, so I'm not sure what I did differently there. Um, let me look at my speakers look good. Hmm, my main volume is up. Uh, my, my channel volume, I got my that, that. Hmm. Well, we're going to get serious here now. 
Okay, well, I don't know if that does it a little bit better, but um, and maybe I'm just not talking at typical volume. That is my mic, my desktop. I'm gonna mute my desktop. Um, no, I'll leave it unmuted because I got some videos we want to talk about today. It's 11:41. Still got a little bit of time. Um, there's the Menti code. Menti code's down below. How many people we got? How many diehard safety people we got? Seven out there. All right. Much better now when you move the mic closer. Well, that's that's what we will do. If that's what we got to do, then that's what we got to do. I've got an excellent connection here. I got to open my little PowerPoint for Shock Week. Safety by design. All right. So, let's see. We got nice and sunny in Saskatoon. 63. Beautiful. It's beautiful outside here, too, in West by God, Virginia. Um, uh, really nice and uh, nice and cool outside. So... We're going to have a good day. Hopefully, everybody out there is going to have a good day as uh, we get people to dial in. We're going to see. This is, like I say, this is going to be this is going to be the proof of the pudding on who is uh, who are the diehards out there on this holiday Friday. Hey, Bascar, good to see you, buddy. Got Ryan Jackson in the house. Man, talk about diehards. Jeez, Ryan in the house. Nihad El Sharif. We got Diego. We got Costa Rica represented. David Engelhold, Florida is represented. Ryan, where where are you at, Ryan? Are you in um are you in you're not in Colorado? You're out there in uh man, where is it? Um Oh my gosh! Well, I can't remember what state. Not North. Not the Dakotas. Not Idaho. I can't remember. Good morning, Buscar. I can't remember where you're out of, Ryan. What's the weather like where you're at these days? We know Costa Rica is. Um, Costa Rica is partially cloudy and rainy. It's about seventy-two degrees down there with Diego. Nihad says uh, 60 to 30, 63 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, Utah. That's right. He's out of Utah. That's right. And Bruce B., a diehard. Man, you guys are something else. Salt Lake City. That's right. Salt Lake City, Utah. Man. Well, that's a good thing. Keeping it real. I'm. I'm. I want your guys' uh, ideas on. Um, on. Uh, on safety by design practices and principles. I want to make. I'm going to try to make this as open as I can. So I want. I want to get some ideas from all of you on what you. Uh, what you recommend and how you do the uh, safety by design principles. Things that you may be implementing, or even if you don't implement, just uh, based on uh, your knowledge and in electrical systems what are things that we can do to help reduce the likelihood of shock because you know why because this week is shock week yes it is shock week and um i'm 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 i actually i came down here this morning and uh i had yesterday's coffee still in my thermos so i am drinking yesterday's coffee i truly am Southwest Florida. You know, I used to live in uh, Tampa or St. Petersburg, actually. I worked uh, on contract for about five years with, or no, actually three years. Three years, I think it was, with um, Florida Power Corporation. Not Florida Power and Light, but Florida Power Corporation. We worked on Crystal River Unit 3. I did uh, short circuit studies. I did some coordination studies. Worked on generator studies. Um, helped design the... Um, Help design the security system. So that was a lot of fun. Absolutely a lot of fun. All right, we're going to test some screens here. So um, I got to get my software up. 
Hmm. I wonder. Oh, I know why. See, I gotta fix this. I think I hold Alt down. Yeah. If I hold Alt down, you can see the whole screen. Look at that, boy. So that is screen number two. And it's not Jim. Jim is not here. So what I have to do is I've got to go here to guest name. And the guest name is going to be Monitor 2. <laughs> yep, Monitor 2. That's not too bad. So I have a, I've got a, you know, one of, one of these days I'm going to do a little YouTube video of my setup here because um, it's incredibly easy to go live uh, on YouTube. And I've had a lot of questions on how I'm doing this and, and whatnot and the tools and everything that I'm using. So I think, um, I think I'm going to do a session on um, how to do uh, a go live on YouTube. Sounds like fun. What doesn't, I mean, I don't know. My hands are tied to ensuring the design complies to the adopted codes. I don't know. Yeah, well, that's right. You know what, David, though? Um, it's good to educate, though. I know, um, I know, you know, we all are very educated in our industry and we become uh, more. Whoa, Steve Froming in the house on a holiday yes some even here on a work holiday that's exactly right so mine's a work holiday too today and um i'm here uh just filling out because shock week's an important week um so we are uh, we're making it happen and thanks to guys like steve froming dave engelhart ryan jackson bruce bascar we got bascar where are you out of uh, Beskar Ben, I don't know if I'm saying your name right. Banar, Banerji, Banerji, Banerji. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Beskar. But where are you out of? Uh, I know where Ryan's out of. We know where David Engelhart's out of. I'm here in West by God, Virginia, right across the state line from Pennsylvania. And about, uh, I could probably, um, I could probably throw a rock into Pennsylvania. Uh, it would be a tough throw from where I'm at right now, but it wouldn't, uh, I could probably, uh, I could probably shoot a bow and arrow. I can shoot an arrow into Ohio. Um, I don't know. That's a little bit, a little bit of a, little bit of a stretch. It's state law that the applicable code references be quoted with my rejection comments. Yes, you can't reject anything. You're, you're right. You can't reject uh, things that aren't a code requirement. Yep. Behind the scenes would be great. Yeah, that's what we'll do, Steve. Uh, we're going to do a behind the scenes. Yeah, it's, um, you got to, there you go. Okay, Nihad El Sharif is going to start the, um, hold on. He's going to start the, uh, Nihad El Sharif is going to start the Canadian Technical Social Distancing Network. <laughs> that's just wrong all right because uh we are in the middle of shock shock oh man the wisconsin r and r ranch okay western section if anybody on this there's only 12 of us this is going to be a really light day i'm not anticipating this this is going to be a I, I I'm I'm hoping that we have a very um, informal. You notice I don't even have my eaten shirt on. I've got an eaten mug. I've got my eaten mug, but you know what's in here? Yesterday's coffee. There's even a there's even a line inside. Oh, that is disgusting. Um, I'm drinking yesterday's coffee out of my out of my thermos. Um, I've got water here just in case there was some mold. I got some water. Um, but uh, today's going to be a, a pretty informal day. I'm hoping that we have a good discussion. I'm, I'm, I want to see because the people that are on this call today are the hardcore safety guys. Because remember that today's a holiday and we should be outside enjoying the sun, getting a tan, maybe swimming in the pool. 
David Dave uh, David Engelhart. You're he's in Florida for God's sakes. He's probably be on the ocean, um, enjoying life and all that good stuff. Um, Nihad Al Sharif. It's beautiful weather up in the, uh, up in his world in Canada and Saskatoon, and um, and you know he's going to start the uh, the the technical social distancing network. The uh, hey Nihad, it's not T S N D, not North Dakota. It's DN, TSDN, man. Technical Social Distancing Network. Oh, my gosh. Nihad. You blew it, buddy. That's it. You cut off. Oh, man. What time is it? 11.54. Yep. So, oh, I'm supposed to be getting stuff ready. Um, I am... I might as well turn it on, and uh, we're going to bring in our Facebook friends right now. We're going live on Facebook, so for those of us on, those of you out there, we are already having a blast on in YouTube land. Uh, we're bringing in the Facebook uh, fold. I'm going to uh, throw this video out on my LinkedIn site, so everybody out there all of my my cohorts in crime at uh, at eaton are probably sitting on their boat looking at their phone going holy crap tom is going live again it's insane um so today is we're talking we're continuing our shock week and we are going to have a this is an informal uh two-hour session where we are going to hopefully share some ideas um, i was thinking about i was actually thinking about maybe even calling people um, and letting people uh, get their words in uh, to talk about safety. I don't know if, if somebody out there wants to do that. Um, you can send me an email if you want to get online and go live with me. Um, my email is Thomas A. Dimitrovich at Eaton.com. What you would have to do is send me your phone number and I would call you. And then we could, uh, if you wanted to share a safety uh, advice or uh, safety by design principle that you would recommend or you think is uh, something worth uh, almost embarrassing yourself online, uh, you know, hey, make it happen. Send me a note. Menti code is down below uh, for the hardcore people on the line. These are the hardcore safety professionals. Uh, let's see what we go. Oh, I don't want to click that. Let's see. I've now, oh, I, you know what the other thing I got to do? I have I have a little start button here. So I'll tell you what, uh, another cool tool, if you, I don't know, um, I don't know if uh, Ryan, I know you do live stuff, Mr. Jackson. Um, I use a stream deck. I don't know if you use a stream deck, but uh, it is really cool. Uh, it helps me, here it is. Uh, I don't want to upset the apple cart, but this is what it looks like. So this, um, this little tool, it, um, I hope I can see what the heck I'm doing. Yeah, here it is here. So it, it's kind of bright. You see that? This is how I, I start my program. I'm going to try to not drop it. And still point at it so I start my program over here I just press these buttons and like for example where is my there's my live right here I press that I got a little menu option here and then if I do this I believe it's just me look at that and then if I do this this one it's me and them then if I want to have a guest I have a whole nother thing. I have just me. I have just the guest, which is that screen. I have, uh, what is it? Uh, what's this one here? Three tight. That's the three of us. Look at that. And that was Jimmy. Jimmy was here yesterday. That's uh, monitor two. And there's just me. So... I tell you what, the stream deck is, um, if, if you ever, you know, something that just navigate, uh, through on, um, all these things, this was, 
I don't know. I think it cost me about 150 bucks or something like that. I bought that a while ago. Um, yeah, you, I, I tell you what, it, Ryan, it, this the stream deck, it's, uh, I can't think of the name of the company that makes it, but, um, very worth, very worth, um, uh, using it is, it is, uh, it is really cool. It's, it's, it's just one of those things where you, um, you just press the buttons. It takes you from scene to scene and, uh, and you pre-program things. So I, I can put a, I can press a button and have it send a tweet for me, which it does. And right now my Twitter account should show, I'm going to try it here. It's 11. I got two minutes. Uh, it should show social distancing network, um, Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. It should have live after my name. If it did it right. How do I do a look at my tweets? Tom Dimitrovich tweets, uh, join me live on YouTube. Ah, 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 ah I got to change it. You know what I did? I, I ch <laughs> Everybody's going to be like, oh, that's yesterday's program, Tom. I got to go up and I got to go to start. And then there's a, it didn't change my name to Thomas Dimitrovich live. Well, that's uncool. I'm going to tweet with, and I'm just going to put uh, www.thomas, nope, not Thomas, youtube.com slash c slash Thomas Domitrovich. All right. And then when I press, when I press, whoop, when I press start, it should tweet. Um, there's, uh, hmm. I don't know, but it's supposed to tweet. It should tweet profile. That was yesterday. Tweets and replies. Catch me live on YouTube. Supposed to tweet, but it, I don't know if it tweeted or not. Change, it's supposed to change my Twitter name to Th Thomas Dimitrovich dash live and a dot, but it didn't do that. Well, I don't know. I got to have something wrong on here, but or maybe it did it and I just don't know it. But that's okay because it did it yesterday. But anyway, stream the Stream Deck is a really cool tool to um, to use. If you um, uh, there's a lot of different things that it can do, and there's actually uh, I'll show you on my screen. There's the um, there's one with me. So this is the Stream Deck app, and um, hope it's twelve oh one. Heck with that. We are going to go into our program today, which is live topic. Welcome to the continuation of Shock Week. We are finishing off this day with um, we're finishing off this day with a uh, discussion around safety by design. So. I got to turn all of these these menti codes off because we are beyond the menti code stage. We are now into our program and we are going to be talking about um, we're going to be talking about uh, safety by design principles. And this is a this is it's a holiday weekend. We're right here in um, um, we're right here in uh Fourth of July weekend, and and those of you who are online right now are hardcore people because you should be outside enjoying the sun and enjoying uh, a hamburger or a hot dog right now. But instead, you are here talking about safety by design, and I really appreciate your commitment to electrical safety uh, because I'm here too. Um, all right, Steve Froming, birthday's coming early. XSplit broadcast on my second monitor to change screens and things. Oh, XSplit. 
Yeah, you ought to try. I'm, I'm, I might take a look at XSplit uh, too. But um, uh, remember to hit the like button. Remember to you know subscribe to my YouTube channel, please. I, I think uh, I'm gonna be I'm going to be pro doing some more recordings as well because I'm doing more videos uh, internally for some of my own salespeople, and I'm going to try to repurpose a lot of that and put it out there online. So, yes, PDH. Bavish Modi, there is PDH hours uh, associated with this. You grab that Menti code 776482. So go to Um and go and type in 776482. Enter your information. And remember, at the end, we do the same doggone thing. Okay, so uh, let's talk about safety by design because we're continuing shock week. And let's talk first a little bit about what did we learn over this past week of shock week. We had Nihad El Sharif on, on uh, Monday with us. And if you recall, Nihad and I talked about ground fault circuit interrupters. We understood now where the... Um, where the four to six milliamp came from. We understand let go thresholds, how we came up with those values of let go thresholds and those tables that we use in, um, in the national, in, not the national, but NFPA 70 E and a lot of safety training has those thresholds that, that we know about. And, and, you know, I asked uh, Jim uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday uh, about, you know, like, why do we educate on those let go thresholds? You know what? We know that we can't, based on our discussion on Monday, we can't control how much current flows through the body, right? We can control, um, possibly can control what portion of the body uh, that the current flows through. Uh, We can control, uh, how how fast we trip something offline. We can control what else, um, whether or not we even come in contact with anything, right? Uh, establishing an electrically safe work condition. We talked about that yesterday with Jimmy. Uh, Jim Jim Dollard, you know, he's a, he's a very smart individual. He's got a lot of experience under his belt with regard to uh, worker safety. Um, and and so we we, if you think about, the what we did last week, we started off first understanding shock, understanding how GFCIs work, understanding the standards around ground fault circuit interrupters, the different types of ground fault circuit interrupters. That's a good basis to build off of. Tuesday, we talked about one of the most dangerous pieces of equipment outside of that service entrance panel board, um, or that first panel board on the secondary of a transformer, which we've talked about in past weeks. Uh, but we talked about the motor control center with Matt Hussey. And um, Matt Hussey, uh, you know, really educated us on the fact that, um, that, that the, the motor control center is a piece of equipment where there's probably a higher likelihood, arguably, a higher likelihood of justified energized work. And why is that? Because in a motor control center, there you're dealing with motor control circuits, which you may be doing troubleshooting on a motor uh, or a motor starter circuit. Uh, you're dealing with relays, sometimes contacts that you're supposed to fire off or not fire off. Um, uh, maybe uh, some drive equipment that may not be functioning the way you think it should be functioning or you need to verify things. You're going to be taking testing and measurements. All of that activity can be construed as justified energized work because we can't test for uh, different. We can't test to make sure a circuit is working correctly if we shut it off. So, uh, so, so we understood about motor control centers and a lot of the safety features around that, because as um, as Matt pointed out, and you know he did a, you know he did a, uh, you know Matt's a Matt's a Matt's a sharp individual. Uh, he pointed out the fact that uh, the motor control center, the equipment that's involved in electrical incidents, the motor control centers is is second up there, and, and it's right next to control equipment, right? So. And what do we have in motor control centers? Control equipment. 
So, and, and, the, and I, in my opinion, and I don't know where your guys' heads at on a lot of this material, this, uh, in this type of discussion, but in my opinion, motor control centers and control equipment, that's where we do a lot of troubleshooting, justified, energized work. Um, and that's the, 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 when you're doing that work, the awareness of what you're touching and how you're touching it and, um, and, uh, you know, did you, are you using the right meter? Things of that nature. I mean, there's a lot of faults that happen when they use the wrong meter. So uh, motor control centers, we've established. Motor control centers is an area that um, should deserve a little bit more attention and closer attention when it comes to safe work practices and safety by design principles. So that was a, uh, that was a critical, critical thing we learned on Tuesday. Wednesday, we went over marinas and we learned about, um, the, about Lucas Ritz. We learned about Michael Cunningham, Noah Winstead, Nate uh, Linham, Michael Knudsen, and Carmen, uh, a 34-year-old. And in the ranges of, 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 uh, of deaths and uh, individuals who die in and around marinas, and that continues on. Uh, there are resources, you know, I, and from an electric shock drowning perspective, <clears throat> From an electric shock uh, uh, drowning perspective, there is um, a this website here, which uh, this is from electricshockdrowning.org, and uh, you know I was scrolling on this thing. Um, you're you're gonna find this uh, you're gonna find this interesting. This was from a James D. Schaefer, Captain David E. Rifkin, Quality Marine Services LLC, uh, out of Jacksonville, Florida. Um, they have their information there. This was from 2019. So, uh, you know, a year or so ago, this is April of 19. We're in 2020, right? And yep. So a little over a year ago. So uh, this, what's interesting about this uh, high voltage gradients required for electric shock drowning could not be established with available fault current levels. No cases can we attribute cause of death to electric shock drowning in salt water. And I mentioned this. You know, we had this discussion about whether uh, salt water is more susceptible than, than fresh water. And, and in my, you know, my experience in this world, I know that I've had a lot of, uh, a lot of examples of deaths in and around fresh water. I couldn't find any in and around uh, salt water. Not that salt water is not a hazard, but that I just could not find anything. And here's a, rep whoops, and here's a report here. That's why I hate having this microphone so close. But uh, for some reason, I need it close. I don't know what's wrong, but in any case, um, the, um, the, um, um, the, the, this report basically gives us information that is, sort of confirms what I was saying, but what's disturbing about this, uh, in my opinion, here is. You know, these are, this is his list that the, these two individuals put together with regard to the examples of deaths in and around marinas. So the dates are all over the place. I mean, and they're not like this. I'm not talking 1900 something. We're talking in the last few years. Um, and as you, and as I scroll down through here, I'm seeing 25 year old, 15 year old. Uh, three children were killed in a pool at a water park. Uh, and then uh, the park manager and his son jumped in to help the three children. They all died. And, you know, that's what goes on in around these marinas is you have one person who's who's uh, experiencing a problem. Somebody else else goes to save them. They experience a problem. And we all want to be heroes. We want to help. And we when we don't understand what's going on, but five people died in that example in turkey and it's not so that doesn't that's that that's an example it's not just here in the united states it's it's a it's a global issue um there's an 11 year old uh, girl was killed and this was she touched a boat lift that was electrified right so there's a 19 year old boy a 23 year old boy and this list look where i'm at on this i i'm 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 pretty high up in this document there are example after example after example. So, you know, it's this is one of those things that, you know, marinas may have, when that marina was brand new, it may have been perfect, it may have been the picture 
of safety. But then as time goes on, because of lack of maintenance, uh, things go downhill. Uh, but in any case, and maybe when it was brand new, it wasn't the picture of maintenance. I, I got on the roof one time. Uh, we were I was learning about photovoltaic systems. And what I've learned in my career is that when I want to learn about uh, photovoltaic systems, if I want to uh, learn about a new topic, I do an educational program. Uh, d develop the slide decks and when you're putting and Ryan you know this and and other people who educate there's a lot of people on this uh, on this in you know out there in YouTube land that uh, do educations and what we do whenever we're putting together an educational material we want to be accurate in what we're talking about we want to I call it tell the story right we learn from each other not because we're sitting there and I'm telling you to read this chapter, that chapter, this chapter. We're going to learn from each other uh, the way we've learned and handed down information for years, and that is telling stories about uh, scenarios and things that went wrong or things that went well, how we did something, how we do things. So I went on a roof with an electrical inspector. It was a brand new inst. Uh, brand, brand, no, 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 no. Brand new installation. I'm going to snooze for four hours. You know what this is saying? Look at this. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. Look. See what this is saying? Look at this. IT says, we want to restart your computer to complete the installation. I say, I'm going to say, remind me again in four hours. Wow. Anyway, uh, that's, just, that's just wrong. Uh, in any case, that was scary. Um, I got on a roof with an electrical inspector for a photovoltaic system, and it was a brand new project. And this was his, I think, third or fourth time inspecting that roof. And so uh, I went up with him because, uh, and, and I had just taken a class. There was a Penn State was doing a class up in our Warrendale facility uh, that we were working with them. And I did a class with them on photovoltaic systems. I monitored that class, and, and, and I was taking a lot of notes. I was getting a lot of pictures, so I have a really good... PV presentation, which maybe one day I'll do online. It's hard to pare that down though. But in any case, um, so I got up on a roof with him and it looked great. I mean, there was, it was brand new installation. All of the hardware was brand new. All of those panels were brand new. It was, it was spick and span clean. I got a picture of a grasshopper laying on top of that PV system. And I might even be able, I might even find that some of the pictures for you. Um, but he, um, we get, we got up there and we started to walk around and we were walking down next to one of the PV systems, the, 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 uh, solar, uh, panels. And he turned around and looked at me real quick. And he says, put your hands in your pocket and don't touch anything. And I was like, okay. So I, I, I put my hands in my pocket and then, and then we're walking around and he proceeded to show me how nothing up there was bonded. And, 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 uh, what happened was that they, uh, he was up there the first time and the individual, the, um, uh, the, the, the contractor did not have bonding straps on everything. And he told them to put bonding straps in and, uh, and then, um, he was coming back for a second, uh, uh, review and he found that, the the bonding what the guy did instead of just putting the bonding straps on between uh structure to structure or panel to panel he basically um he basically I, and i'm doing this because I'm, I'm i'm hesitating because i'm i'm trying to throw some stuff up he put together uh he used what they call weebs i i i was referring to them as dweebs but uh they're actually weebs and um he was um that's not the right one so here's a here's a, this these were the panels and i think this is the one i'm almost positive that's the one uh I, we were looking at how the the wires and everything were tucked in and all that stuff looked good i was looking at these panels on the on the on the ground they um in in a, in on how many how many of you do photovoltaic systems? But when you look at this, this pan was resting right on the rubber roof, which 
he looked at that and said, well, that's wrong because he's jeopardizing the, uh, the roof on this, uh, on this. And he told, told the contractor, uh, this uh, about that before. And then we were looking at, uh, all of the different, uh, uh, you know, uh, connection points. And I think this might be the, whoop, no, this might, that might've been the picture. Hold on. I got to figure out how to, uh, how to find the right photo for all of you because uh, he showed me this and then I understood what he was talking about. But um, yeah, it's right here. How do I rotate? Here we go. I'm going to rotate this and then how do I zoom? Here we go. There's the plus. All right, there we go. You see this right here is where I'm looking. Um, this, Underneath here, they he the this contractor instead of putting the daisy chains on each of these, he used what they call weebs or something like that, or I call them dweebs, but I don't think that's right. And you see that little dot right there? That dot is supposed to be under the panels, digging into the metal to establish a bond be from one panel to the next. Because what this thing's doing up here, these are these are like um, uh, that that aluminum that that you need to scratch the surface to be able to get a good bond. None of the weebs that were used were installed correctly, and none of that material, um, none of the uh, installation was actually bonded. Um, and he, and once he started, and we were going, and he was showing me those uh, those example after example after example of uh, how that technology was uh, not quite cutting it for him. And then there's another one here. I'll show you uh, a picture of one of the connectors. Where is it at? One of the connectors was, was not even, um, was not even installed uh, on the, um, on the, on the system. It was just basically sitting there as a, as a connection. And, and oh, where is it? It was just resting on top of the, uh, of the, oh man, I can't find it. But here, here's where he was, he was explaining to me uh, about how uh, the, 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 um, the PV, when you set it on a roof, uh, well, from a design perspective, you've got to ensure the integrity of the, um, of, of the roof. And the they had these cement blocks were and and these these clips here were right on top of the roof which you know that that system like vibrates because of wind or may shift a little bit because of wind and they were rubbing and on the roof and that would violate or void the warranty of the roof for this customer uh, in addition, none of some of these supports, not, not none of them, but some of those supports weren't even in the right location. So um, there's a couple from a safety by design perspective. Uh, you have to understand, in my opinion, you have to understand the technologies that you're using when you're employing them and then make sure that uh, that the installers and, and everybody who's working to install that uh, equipment in that job site are doing that uh, correctly. So, um, and you could tell how slow my computer is uh, uh, right now. I'm getting a new computer. It's not gonna. It's gonna take maybe three months for me to get it. But it's like a, it's it's a machine. It's a screaming machine. So in any case, um, we uh, we learned a lot about uh, uh, the unique installations, and and I and I use marinas as a unique installation, but photovoltaic systems, wind systems. Uh, every system is unique in its own way. So we have to just remember um, that uh, um, that when we design systems and we put things together, simple is better. And think about uh, the electrical worker in, in, your, in the process of your design. Another thing that we learned last week was that I believe it's, uh, we saw some percentages, right? We saw that about 98% of uh, fatal occupational uh, electrical injuries are electrical shock injuries. 
So shock is uh, one of those uh, one of those things that um, is important, and we don't talk enough about 70e. Uh, and if you have the 2018 version of 70e, I am on three PowerPoint. So um, if you go to Annex K, there's a lot of good information in here that explains to us about the uh, the fact that 98% uh, of fatal occupancies are uh, are shock injuries, and then uh, that it's not just the electrical worker we're thinking about. We got to think about the non-electrical workers because. Um, out of that 98%, about, uh, it says, uh, a large share of non-electrical workers, electrical incidents were found uh, to involve a large share of non-electrical workers with approximately one half of the inv incidents involving workers from outside the electrical craft. Now, these are electrical workers. We're not even really talking about the, um, those who are residing in the, in the occupancies or the structures that we're designing and putting together. Um, Outside of the trades, a very good example is um, a good example. I'm, I'm hesitating because um, I, I used this this example a while ago. I tried to get a change around metal framing in the National Electrical Code. I failed twice so far, and um, I've used uh, I've used this gentleman's name before in my examples because uh, Raphael Ugaldi is uh, or was um, an individual who was doing his job one day and what he did was basically went to a uh, a house to deliver a dryer I believe it was so he was an appliance delivery guy uh, I'm not sure what where he who he worked for but he was uh, delivering a um, a dryer to a house. He went into the laundry room. He installed the dryer. And then when he pushed the vent through the wall, he was electrocuted. And what they found was that the frame of the house, which was metal in, in, in construction, was energized because of a faulty wire. So uh, and actually what, what happened was that they had a drywall screw, which is only a, a, a that's about a one inch drywall screw, penetrated a um, NM wire that was in the metal framing. And it um, uh, basically energized the frame. And what happened was Rinaldi, uh, and I have the link to this down below uh, for, for in my YouTube channel and this. And I also have a link to this in my resource uh, which I'll show you in a few seconds here on my LinkedIn site. But Mr. Rinaldi uh, did not expect to not to re return home that day. He was just delivering a dryer. And when he installed and pushed the, um, when he pushed that vent through the wall, it became in contact with the, with the metal framing and then he was electrocuted. There was no GFCI on that circuit because it wasn't required by the National Electrical Code. Um, and it was a part of the home run circuit, which even if it was a part of the National Electrical Code, it probably would not have been protected anyway. Uh, they had some pictures and, and they used to have a video. See this, there's a link here, uh, Click Orlando Problem Solvers, and, and that no longer works. But I'll tell you what that video showed. They had a contractor who was in the house with the reporters and, and probably lawyers. And he took a voltmeter and he opened up the medicine cabinet in a bathroom. And he opened that cabinet up. He put the one lead on the bolt that was on the medicine cabinet. He put the other lead on the faucet, which we know faucets, you know, connects to the pipes. It's all grounded. Obviously copper piping. And he had 120 volts. And he said, and, and he showed the meter and he says, I have a hundred. He says, don't, don't touch anything because I have 120 volts. And that reminded me about that inspector on the PV on that roof that I was in. He told me to put my hands in my pocket because he was uh, nervous about what may have been energized and uh, not clearing, uh, you know, just no potential. I could complete a circuit at that point if I touched two panels. Um, so in any case, uh, this now, the discussion at Co-Making Panel 2 at the time 
was that well it was a um it was a misuse or a, a that that wire apparently they didn't use the grommet uh that was supposed to provide the distances uh because there's there's requirements that uh, when you're going through metal framing etc but my response to that was ground fault circuit interrupters aren't needed because you did everything right think about it a ground fault circuit interrupter is not needed if i don't drop my appliance in the water if i don't accidentally come in contact with an energized part if i don't damage my extension cord if i don't damage the cord on my appliance if i replace my appliances uh, before they reach their end of life and just go buy a new one and say, I'm going to get rid of this because you know what? Eventually it might become a shock hazard. We just don't do that, right? And Mr. And Mr. Raphael Ugoldi did not expect what he received that day and nor did the electrical contractor. The electrical contractor didn't put the drywall in, right? You'll have many trades come in and around residential homes and in commercial buildings and individuals outside of the electrical trade can uh, experience shock. And we have to remember, and that's why Annex K reminds us that. We had that discussion with Jimmy Dollard. We had that discussion with, um, with, with, uh, with Mr. Uh, Nihad El Sharif. Jeez. You know, I, I, I just I, I feel so bad for for um, for Mr. Yagaldi that um, and that was in Florida, Claremont, Florida. I don't know if uh, I don't know if uh, anybody on the on the YouTube uh, uh, has uh, was aware of that or, um, you know. Is aware of Mr. Yagaldi's issues, but, um, you know, that uh, the, the whole concept of metal framing and NM wire being pulled through metal framing, it may not be a code requirement to ground fault circuit interrupter protect those branch circuits, but it would be a good design decision from increasing safety to provide ground fault protection uh, in those areas. Now, we, we said, remember, in a marina, I remember you voted for that, Nihad. I appreciate that. And it didn't make it. And I did, and that was the second try. Um, I think, you know what I think? I think I can't be the one delivering that message. Unfortunately, as a manufacturer, uh, they look at a manufacturer and say, well, he just wants to sell ground fault circuit interrupters. And that's, that's not the case. I mean, when, when I look at things like this and I look at the, the, uh, here's what happened. I, I, in, in that cycle, I, um, I was down at the Southern section meeting and this was a while ago. I think it was 2011 cycle. When I, when did this happen? This happened, um, geez, 2006. Yeah. 2006. And it was our panel board. So we really couldn't talk about it until after everything went, uh, was settled and all that other good stuff because, uh, you know, they tried to sue us. They tried to sue the, uh, the electrical contract. It was an accident. It wasn't required to be GFCI protected. Nobody planned to put that screw through there, um, you know, and it was just a purely an accident. But it could have been prevented if if GFCI protection would have been provided above and beyond uh, bare minimum code requirements. So in any case, um, uh, we learned in in this uh, experience in, when I when I was submitting this, I was at the Southern Section meeting, and I. I, I stood up and, and well, actually, Donnie Cook, Shelby County, he, he's the one who said, you know what, uh, he's going to make try to make it an IEI pub, uh, uh, public input. And when he uh, stood up and, and they, they put it up on the screen and everybody was debating it, Jack, uh, John Minnick, which was our Southern Field NEMA rep, stood up and he said, is anybody having or seeing problems with NM wire installed through metal framing? And two individuals stood up and shared their story of two friends that they lost because of coming in contact with metal framing that was energized, did not trip the circuit breaker uh, because of the low fault currents, ground fault currents, uh, that a GFCI probably would have saved their lives. So when we went to that first draft meeting, 
and this was like in the 11 cycle, we had three deaths associated with NM wire being installed in, uh, in metal framing. I think it's an issue. I think that uh, we can increase safety, whether it's a code requirement, safety by design would say, if you're using metal framing, either you use NM with GFCI, or you can take and put uh, MC cable, which I think is probably more appropriate uh, in that, but in, in in metal framing. Now you'll see a lot of metal framing in uh, in uh, what do you call it? Um, um, commercial construction, and I, I don't you know I don't know how my computer is going to do uh, on this. And yeah, you know uh, I saw I'm going to need a um, um, what do you call it a uh, Solid state drive, Ryan. I and I have uh, this machine I ordered. <laughs> I'm surprised Eaton bought it for me. Um, it's like I don't know, like eight eight thousand dollars or whatever it is. But it is a uh, it's a screaming machine. But uh, my thoughts are that I don't know how how long this uh, shelter in place business is going to last. And quite frankly, I like the shelter in place. Um, uh, I like this opportunity to share information. I mean, I think about it. I've got 20 people right now on YouTube who should be out, uh, ex, uh, you know, surfing, um, enjoying the sun, enjoying the holiday. Uh, and we're here learning and talking about electrical safety, which is to me uh, phenomenal. And and the videos are getting thousands of views, which I'm very happy with. Uh, so I am probably going to, uh, going to continue. Uh, but I'm looking for... Uh, I was looking for some pictures on, um, on my hard drive here for uh, what, what when you get into commercial construction, you will typically see uh, that MC cable used quite a bit because of the fact that um, that uh, they use metal framing and and that's just like the decision of choice in uh, in in that type of construction. So um, here is. Uh, show you how how slow my computer is right now I don't know if you uh, if it even switched yet but um, you know here's an example of the of MC cable you'll see a lot of metal framing uh, in this in this uh, example here I'm just gonna give it to you closer um, but that's all all of your all of your 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 conductors got a it's protected now not that it is impossible for um, not that it's impossible for, uh, for something to pe penetrate this, but uh, a drywall screw will probably have a little bit more difficult of a time uh, penetrating this type of, uh, of wiring method. Um, and NM wire is probably just uh, one of those cases where, you know, uh, probably should not be permitted in uh, use with metal framing. But again, I tried twice. And I and my only thought process is um, on why something like this would fail, even though we had body counts associated with it, and the obvious hazard that everybody even agreed with uh, would be that I think that some people may think that um, you know just trying to be a little self-serving. But um, in any case, I believe I firmly believe in that, and and I think um, you know, uh, safe from a safety by design perspective, using materials, understanding the installation, even though one method is permitted other methods may be a better choice and in reality probably don't add that much more cost to the picture i think it was john mccamish uh john mccamish is um uh, was on panel two with me and we were talking about arc fault circuit interrupters and that you know there's an exception or one of the options in um in 210.12 says uh, that you can use an OBC AFCI downstream of a thermomagnetic circuit or yeah thermomagnetic circuit breaker uh, on the home run circuit as long as the home run circuit is protected by uh, it says metal raceway metal raceways metal wireways metal auxiliary gutters or type MC or AC cable meeting the applicable requirements of 250.118. So these types of conductors can offer a protection in that home run circuit. And John McCamish noted, he said, look, in, in, in the installation, this conductor is really not much more expensive at all 
over top of NM wire. So um, it's a it's it's a viable solution, a good option that you might want to employ in your safety by design principles and practices. Just saying. Um, all right. Let's take a look. And the other thing we talked about. So we talked about the 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 thresholds. And I'll tell you what, I learned some stuff with Nihad. You know, um, when w w working together, I'm just I'm just going to look through um, some of the comments here. I fixed many of those cords before they started their day. Also, many times the carpenter saw saws would trip the GFC GFIs early in the morning. Yes, um, I would run their saws for 10 seconds on a non GFI circuit. There you go, Bruce. Uh, electro electrical contracting work many years ago. <laughs> yeah, I see what he's doing. Trying to get those, uh, those, you got a word limit in here. Um, all right, Nihad, I voted for, thank you, Nihad. I'm just looking at some of these comments because share, share your thoughts, your ideas on safety by design. Um, uh, we just skip the MC stuff and go right to EMT. Yeah, that's true, Don. Um, EMT is, uh, is a is a is a good option as well, but we la we learned uh, on Monday about this uh, curve, which I thought was um, you know we learned together right. So uh, Nihad taught me some things, and and I think we teach each other each other things. Um, what I used to say to people was the four to six milliamps is what helps to prevent your heart from going into defib. And thinking in my mind, you know, a lot of people may have interpreted that differently and, and probably interpreted it the correct way. But I can tell you where my mind was and what I was thinking was that um, that beyond six milliamps, your heart will go into defibrillation. But that was not true. What we learned on Monday was that um, you have uh, here in the United States. Uh, or in North American standards, UL 943, uh, a listed device uses the threshold of four to six milliamps, which is below what they call the let go uh, involuntary muscular contraction uh, threshold. And when you get to 30 milliamps, which is the European standards, they, they uh, will typically trip and possibly go into the area of involuntary muscle contraction. Uh, but they stay away from um, the danger zone, which is ventricular fibrillation. So um, it's important to understand, you know, some of these thresholds because they help us understand uh, the solutions that we're uh, installing, what they can and can't do. Jim Dollard helped us understand what risk was, that we all assume a level of risk. I ride a motorcycle. I will definitely wear my helmet. I may not have my my leathers on. I may not have my jacket on. In fact, I ran to the store the other day, needed to get, um, needed to get a, uh, uh, what was it, man? I think it was a bolt. I was working on my, in my garage on some, um, I was mounting my saw to the, uh, to a new stand that I built, my chop saw. I got a miter station now and um, I needed a bolt. So I jumped on my bike. I threw my helmet on, but I had I had a t-shirt and I had my jeans on and, and I ran to the store. Uh, I accepted a level of risk coming back. I thought, eh, I was probably stupid. You know, uh, we all accept some level of risk in our lives. The moment we get into a car and drive to work, even putting your seatbelt on, we've accepted a level of risk. A seatbelt may not save your life. It, um, a, a fall harness may not save your life. It'll reduce the chances, reduce the likelihood. It may re re limit the amount of uh, damage that you have to your body, but it's not a guarantee that if you're in an accident that you are going to walk away from that accident. Um, we all assume a level of risk, uh, and it, which is a combination of the likelihood of occurrence of injury to damage your health and severity. And why is that important in safety by design? Why would I want to understand risk in from a safety by design perspective, why would I want to understand risk assessments? Is because I need to, as a design engineer, as a design build electrical contractor, uh, as whoever it is that you, you know, you could be the owner hiring somebody and telling them this is what I want. You are going to understand what are the activities that could possibly happen. 
what are the hazards associated with uh, the work in hand or the installation. If I'm doing a, a motor control center installation, I may ask for certain things that I might not ask for if I'm installing the residential panel board in my house. Um, so you got to make decisions based upon risk and risk assessments, understanding the, how an electrical workers will be working on this equipment or how you will be interacting with the equipment. Uh, if I have um, an area in my house, which I do, I have a Marshall half stack. I've got a Fender twin reverb. I've got another little Marshall um, um, uh, uh, amplifier over there. I've got a keyboard. Um, I've got a lot of these different things that uh, that are, are appliance related. And, you know, my, my Marshall half stack gets a workout. Uh, you know, I've blown some fuses in that. I've uh, made some neighbors mad. Um, I've made my wife leave the house a couple times because, uh, you know, it just get it's going to get loud. It's going to get loud. Um, but you know, I got a lot of cords and a lot of extensions uh, laying on the ground and, and routed around. I GFCI protected all of my circuits in my house. Um, it has saved me a couple times. It saved, uh, I believe, my wife a couple times. I know uh, she was outside. Uh, she was outside using the hedge trimmers. True story. She'll tell you it. Outside using the hedge trimmers, she came over to me and said, and this is shortly after I changed all of the breakers in the house because we had water damage in the house here. And uh, I had like 48,000 of gallons of water come down through um, while we, when we first moved down to Missouri. And uh, we replaced the panel board. I had two load centers. I now have a 42 circuit panel board in there with uh, loaded up. Um, I, they had to replace the hot water tanks. They wouldn't replace. State Farm said, we're not going to touch the lighting fixtures. I called uh, my buddy Dave Mercier at Southwire, uh, and he said, you know what? Water just came down through. You don't have, don't have to worry about the NM wire uh, as long as it wasn't submerged and, and wicked up in there. It was just a, you know, over top of the insulation. So I didn't feel too bad about the wire infrastructure, but I was concerned about the lighting. So I bought uh, GFCI breakers uh, for the entire house. My electrician called me. I was in St. Louis. He's up here. He says, uh... He goes, Mr. Dimitrovich, uh, you um, you bought the wrong circuit breaker, so I'm going to go over to Home Depot and 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 get uh, thermal magnetic thermal magnetic breakers. He says you've got these arc fault ground fault devices, and he told me where they were only required and um, et cetera. And I said, no, 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 I I I want you to protect the entire house with ground fault circuit interrupters, uh, all my circuits. And he said, um, he goes, well, you know, you're going to have a lot of tripping issues. And I said. Probably. And you're going to fix them and State Farm is going to pay for them because uh, if there's problems in my wiring, then we're going to find them. And and, um, you know, if there's problems in the fixtures because of the water damage, we're going to find it with the GFCIs. And sure enough, I came to visit. Um, I come up to the house and. Um, the guys in there were doing flooring and. Uh, I, I just walked in, right? And the, the one guy, he's, they're all, they're, they're laying the hardwood floors. And he looks up to me, he says, uh, who are you? And I said, uh, I'm the owner. He goes, oh, you're the owner. He said, yeah, you must be Tom. I said, yep. I said, I'm just, uh, you know, in town, I'm going to, you know, stay up in one of the bedrooms. I brought my sleeping bag because everything was out of the house. And he goes, uh, he goes, well, you know, we're doing the floors, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, you know, your electrician is really mad at you. I said, he's mad at me. Why? He goes, oh, my gosh. And he said, come with me. We walked down the basement, he turned the light switch on and the lights came on and boom, breaker tripped. He goes, you have like five circuits in this house that won't operate. I'm like, well, you know, you know what that means? There's five circuits where current is going where it shouldn't go. Okay. And that's what's going on in my high, my mind. But everybody else was saying, well, that's five circuits where that freaking GFCI is causing me a headache. Well, he fixed all of the issues and we did have damaged lights. We had damaged can lights. He had to change all the can lights in this basement because these circuits would not work. He had to change the light uh, in the uh, uh, dining room because uh, it, water had come down through that, and it was just terrible. It, de it, it degraded inside. Um, I wish we would have had some pictures of the, of the problems, but he fixed all of the problems, and I've been living with GFCI in this house ever since, uh, above and beyond code requirements, but... Again, I want to provide that level of protection. So back to my wife. 
Um, I, um, I'll do that, Tommy. I'll give you a call. So, and I think we talked about uh, a little bit on that as well. Um, I, um, my wife was outside and, um, he was, or she was, uh, cutting hedges and she took and, um, come over to me in the garage and she says, the outlet doesn't work. And I said, what happened? She goes, well, I tripped the breaker. So I went downstairs. Sure enough, she tripped the breaker. So I went outside. And I said, what, ha- what, what were you doing? She goes, I was just cutting hedges and it tripped. And I'm thinking, oh, man. So she went back out again. She comes walking back over and she says, it tripped again. So I, I, before I went down and reset it, I said, show me what you're doing. And, and the cord looked good. Didn't look bad at all. Um, and she showed me what she was cutting, where she was plugged in. Went back downstairs. I said, don't touch anything. So I said, I'm going to go turn the breaker back on. Went back out, and I'm watching her. And she picks it up. She turns it on, and boom, it trips again. And then I see the cut in the cord. So she cut the cord, and it was it, it was, uh, it was hitting the ground. So I said, ah, oh, you cut the cord. So I went, got a different extension cord, brought it out, laid it out. Um, then went downstairs and reset the circuit breaker. About 15 minutes later, she comes walking over. She says, I tripped the breaker again. Went back out, dadgummit, she cut the cord again. I told her how to put the cord over her shoulder and stuff like that. Uh, went back in, reset it. And then I'm in the kitchen, about maybe a, a half an hour later, I'm in the kitchen. We got a lot of hedges around the house. I'm in the kitchen getting some water because I was cutting the grass outside and stuff like that. I come walking in and I, I hear the front door open and she's bringing the extension cord into the dining room and she plugs in. And I'm just laughing because it's GFCI protected. So she went back outside and she yelled, come back in. She yelled at me. She says, I, that none of the breakers in our house work. And I went back out. She cut the cord again. Um, so I finished cutting the, 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 the hedges, but because it is a challenge when you've got a electric uh, hedge, I cut the cord twice after that. Um, I had, I, I don't know, I don't know how I, now what I do is I, I actually tie it to my belt loop in the back. I come up over my shoulder and I, uh, and I go under my arm and then around so that that cord doesn't hang over. But, um, I, um, I protected all of my circuits in my house and I'm, I'm glad I did. Uh, it, it went above and beyond. So, uh, you, you have to understand the, the risks associated, what's going on in, in your structure. I did it for a reason for, because of, I had water coming down through, but I have received the benefit of groundfall protection where it's not required a few times in my time in this house. Uh, in any case, um, uh, DG that is in good policy. I, uh, uh, Tommy, I just removed your message with had your phone number on it. So uh, 90 miles to Chicago. Yep. 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 I'm just looking at some of the comments. All right. So then we understood the hierarchy of risk. And I think it's really important that we understand where in the hierarchy of risk safety by design um, exists. So if you, if you think about uh, safety by design, where's it at? Where's my presentation? Here we go. So we, in the safety by design world, we're delivering, we're delivering. You know, if you drink too much, you hurt your liver. We're living in this portion of the triangle. We're not down in this portion of the triangle. We may be able to facilitate administrative controls. Again, administrative controls, procedures, policies, and training programs, such as job briefings, lockout, tagout programs, arc flash. So those are all educational stuff. In the engineering controls, physical barriers that can be removed, preventing access to live parts. Line side guards, light curtains. So we talked about line side barriers. Uh, we talked about the line side barriers that are required for service entrance equipment. That doesn't mean you can't apply line side barriers in other locations as long as it's specified. The design engineer has a lot of power. The architect and the homeowner or the the facility owner, whether it's a whether you're a large facility like DuPont or Chrysler or GM or Ford, uh, you could be a um, you could be a McDonald's or Burger King or one of those owners. Uh, you could be a uh, commercial building like Eaton. Uh, Eaton has a, a 
a lot of facilities where we house and and keep our uh, employees uh, chained to desks and uh, and we uh, no uh, you know where we where we all congregate and work and and build products and things of that nature. And then we have um, we have those locations like in, from a re- multi dwellings etc. So you could have the owner of a fa- of a business, the owner of a facility, the architect who's very close to the owner, the design engineer. Uh, making decisions to go above and beyond. I always say we should not, as design professionals, be picking this book up when we are going to start our project. We need to understand what are the customer wants and needs. We need to understand the risks and hazards associated with the uh, the project that we're installing. We need to understand uh, possibly the risks and hazards associated with a process. For example, um, I may have an area in a facility that would be qualified or categorized as a a hazardous location. If I know that this room over here is a hazardous location, this room is not, I may, I probably should if I can, put my electrical equipment in this room instead of that room because I will keep it out of an area that is either caustic or uh, will not only, not only will it, uh, put that equipment in an area that is probably not conducive to uh, the cost, right? I can reduce the cost just by relocating some things, get it out of that area, but I'll reduce maintenance. If I can locate, for example, GFCIs, I, in my house, I took all of the GFCI receptacles off of my house on the outside. Um, 55% of them did not work. I calculated the number. I, I would, uh, I pressed the test button and reset button. They would not reset. Uh, I took them out, took them apart, and they, they, I mean, they just, it was time. It was time to replace those devices, obviously. Um, So what I did was I, GFC, I protected all my circuits, and I got those uh, electronic mechanical devices outside of an environment, and I put, uh, like, an outside environment where it has dampness and wet and humidity and all that good stuff, and I brought that technology inside into an uh, an air conditioned room, which is right along, right on the other side of this wall. I've got a 42 circuit uh, uh, CH panel board with all of my GFCIs, all of my AFCIs, my AFGF products are in there. Um, I don't have any GFCI receptacles in the house anymore. Uh, I took those out, but uh, not that those are, are, are bad. I like the the point of use to be able to reset, like in a bathroom. Very convenient to be able to uh, reset in my bathroom or my kitchen. Um, uh, but in any case, you know, thinking about the location of your equipment and what you're doing, what you're doing is you, I could make an argument that you're almost eliminating things like, for example, LED lighting. Think about this. LED lighting in uh, facilities that I don't have. a. Uh, it'll take me longer to get a picture. Um, picture a warehouse with lighting that is really doggone high. And if I'm going to replace any of those lights, I'm going to have to get on a lift. Getting on a lift puts me into a, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have a harness, right? I'm going to have to get up there. And I'll tell you what, me anymore, I ain't getting on lifts, buddy. I, I have a hard time on a freaking ladder. I used to walk peaks. Uh, I used to do roofing. My, my uncle, uh, my uncle had, uh, every summer we did, uh, we did projects, uh, it was a family type of business. We rebuilt, uh, we built, uh, garages, three stall garages. We converted, uh, existing garages into mother-in-law suites. We put roofs on homes. We, uh, gutted an aliqu- the Aliqu- auto parts and, and put a whole floor inside, put an office upstairs storage. We dug, we did a, did a lot of work. I did a lot of work up high. You know what my job was when I was little? You know, my family wasn't very the safest. And this is on Facebook, too. They're probably watching. I would get up on, um, uh, they would put the scaffolding up. And I can remember on uh, my cousin Johnny and my dad, my Uncle Butsy, they're all down there watching. They would, uh, we did a pole. uh, I think it was, uh, they were called up. They were just four by fours. And you would stand on the uh, scaffolding and push a lever with your foot and it would take it up and you had two of you on either side and you both had to do it at the same rate and then they put ladders up to get up there uh pole scaffolding whatever and those four by fours are like this right 
Um, and I can remember my dad saying, oh, hey, go ahead, check it out, Tom. So I would climb up there, get out in the middle of that scaffolding and jump up and down and say, yeah, it's safe, you know. And then I would come back down again and they'd laugh and laugh and laugh. And um, but that was my job. I, I had no problem with heights. Not anymore. Um, so you want to get into this elimination area. If I can, we talked about it with Matt Hussey and with Jimmy. If I can take a 120 volt circuit and get it down to 24 volts DC or or AC, if I can get it below 50 volts, do control circuit wiring at those lower voltages, I've eliminated a hazard or reduced it severely, right? Um, removing underwater. So back to the lighting. If I can put LED lights up there instead of standard lights, then I can reduce the amount of time that I may have to go up, pull maintenance, change it, uh, lighting because LED lights will last a lot longer. Uh, than uh, standard, uh, you know, other types of lights that are used in those applications. So picking a solution based upon the application that will reduce the amount of maintenance associated with it will increase safety because you're not going to put a guy like me on a, on a ladder or a lift where I show I don't belong. Look at this. You guys, I don't know who's given, uh, I don't know how to, look at you, Brian, man, you are, Social distancing version of buying me a beer. I appreciate it, Ryan. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to learn how to do that, too. I think I figured it out. you got to press that uh, little dollar sign down on the bottom. I appreciate the, uh, the beer, buddy, on a, on a uh, Friday afternoon. Um, what's the other one? So I'm just looking. This is a pump jack. Pump jack scaffold. Excellent. I tell you what. And I'm, you don't want to go too high because those four by fours, they look like they're going to break if you go too high. I think that Eventbrite link refers to an earlier event. Ah, it may be. It could be. We people call me crazy, but I agree. My home is at we. All right. So um, substitution, uh, replacing 120 volts with 24 volts. There are a lot of ideas. What? Give me some ideas. You know, put some ideas down there on what would you if 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 you have an idea for substitution, put an S. And then whatever your idea is, if you have an idea for elimination, put an E and whatever your idea is for engineering controls, put an EC on what your idea is. I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, on some some ideas around how do we design in safety? How do we eliminate right off the bat? Uh, again, elim you know, I'll offer an elimination of LED lighting. I could almost eliminate the, the need to go up and replace lights uh, every so often. I'm going to extend that out considerably. Um, uh, so that's, that, that could be one, one, uh, one, one method. Uh, again, uh, if you're going to do a swimming pool, don't put lights in your swimming pool. I wouldn't put lights in my swimming pool. If I could have a pump that didn't work on electricity, I would do that. I don't want electricity in and around my swimming pool. If I, if I have one, my wife wants one and I want one too. It'd be great. Um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe, uh, Ryan, you can uh, throw another five in there for, uh, for a swimming pool, buddy. <laughs> Physical barriers. That's an easy fix, right? The, there, are, there are things we can specify for, for adding barriers and, um, uh, and, and, and disconnects. We, we talked a little bit about disconnects as well. And I want to share with you. I want to share with you, um, we have, where is it at here? Uh, our enclosed, we have what we call enclosed circuit breakers, which is a part of our switch family. Uh, it's out of our, out of Cleveland, Tennessee. And um, I just want to share, uh, our, we call it the flex center. You know what I call it? Now, I am a firearms collector. Um, I'm not ashamed of it. I, I enjoy uh, the mechanical nature of those devices. Um, and I like to, I, I, I like to uh, connect antique ones, really, really old. Uh, our flex center is what I call the, the, um, the uh, custom shop. You know, all these different places that will have, a, they'll build something custom for you. And uh, switching devices, our flex center is our, is our custom shop. Hi, I'm Jordan Ambers, Eaton Switching Device Flex Center Manager. The Flex Center, as the name suggests, is a flexible manufacturing facility that caters to our customers' unique requirements and is where we build the innovative safety switches and enclosed circuit breakers that enhance user safety or ease of installation. 
Besides our special application switches, we make modifications to standard safety switches to meet specific customer demands. This video outlines three of the top modifications that the Flex Center makes to standard safety switch product offering. One of the most common modifications we make to safety switches is to provide multiple or oversized lugs for feed through applications or where voltage drop in long feeder lengths requires oversized conductors. Having the flexibility to maintain a UL listed product in many cases while terminating larger than standard conductors can simplify installation and satisfy even the most observant electrical inspectors. While Eaton's offering of safety switches with viewing windows allow an electrician to visibly verify when a switch is open, an additional measure of safety is to provide an external LED indication. All right, so visible window. Uh, that, in my opinion, I mean, where is it at? There it is. So I have a, if, if, if I take a standard, number one, a safety disconnect switch, you know, putting a safety disconnect switch or specifying a safety disconnect switch in front of equipment that will be maintained often, uh, um, uh, whether it be in, in, our, in our Beaver, Pennsylvania plant where we make our molded case circuit breakers. I love the fact that we make them right here in the United States um, and, and, and right in my backyard because I can go up there anytime and just take a look at those things. Uh, they, um, we, we take the, um, we have in, on our line, we have what we have the enclosed circuit breaker with the arc reduction maintenance switch so that they, they can turn things off easily. It's right there. If you put a lock and tag on it, you're right next to the equipment that you're de-energizing. So you have a very high level of confidence that you're killing power to this and establishing electrically safe work condition. Uh, because you, it's all right there. You're not going back to a panel, looking at a label that somebody put on and say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've got a, a high confidence level that this switch is supplying my equipment. You put that safety disconnect switch right next to the equipment. That is huge. You put a window in to get visible indication that those contacts are open. That is, again, additionally huge. Now, you add the presence of voltage indicator. Um, to this uh, scenario, you have the uh, LED voltage indicator, and we have different types. There's uh, This is one manufacturer's. There's another manufacturer's as well. And you combine both of those together, that's just absolutely uh, insane that you can, you know, get a, a visible indication of separation of those contacts and get a visible indication of the presence of voltage. While we all love gray electrical boxes, all right, custom paint. Uh, think about this. You know, what, what he's pointing out is, now I know that, um, you know, colorblind uh, people are, uh, you know, that they're, they're out there. And, and um, I have some relatives that are colorblind. I know some people I worked with that are color, I work with that are colorblind. Um, but there are some facilities, and, and what he's talking about right now, which I think is, is really important, and he gives some examples of, why and how we will paint some of these disconnect switches, and we do this with our transformers too, uh, a different color. Which is being installed in a prominent location or stand out as a visual indicator of a critical service disconnect. For example, within some manufacturing facilities, disconnects are color-coded orange for easy identification when power to certain areas needs to be disconnected quickly to mitigate risk to personnel or equipment. The Flex Center can provide any custom, custom color option to meet your requirements. And custom colors would, could make, I mean, again, uh, you know, you have to keep in mind um, the fact that uh, some people may be colorblind, but in any case, um, distinctive colors out in your plant can make something stand out so that you know what it's for or that it's there as opposed to blending into the environment. You know, at a house, in a residential home on the outside, you want things to blend. You don't want the electrical equipment to stand out. I mean, outside of my house, I'd love to have a big red uh, service entrance equipment, but my wife would say no. Um, but you want this equipment to uh, stand out from a safety perspective. For any special application where a custom safety switch could make your installation easier or safer, please contact all right, so that's now. Now Nick Kluss is another. He's going to talk about a really 
Good product. Hi, I'm Nick Kluse, product line manager for Safety Switches here at Eaton. At Eaton, our brand promises we make what matters work. And in the Safety Switch product line, we want to help people work more safely because people are what matter the most. According to the Electrical Safety Foundation International, in 2017, there were 136 electrical fatalities, making them the sixth most common type of workplace fatality. Also that year, there were 2,210 non-fatal electrical injuries. That's just too many. While safety switches have been around for over 100 years and are a tried and true product for many applications, we thought we could provide industrials and institutions and other customers with new designs that offer enhanced safety. And with that, we developed two products that specifically address one of the most common. All right, so these are. this is what I wanted to get to. And I, I, I tell you, you know, you think about and and you know we're we're we may be unique in in one of these uh, two products, but the philosophy and concept uh, is something you can employ across any manufacturer. The the product that's uh, shown down on the bottom right there, that is a disconnect switch to go on the outside of an industrial control panel. So if you think about if you have influence in. Um, in, in, in specifying where that disconnect is, a lot of industrial control panels, I, I was watching a YouTube video of one manufacturer and they were explaining the layout of their design and, uh, from, an, uh, from a control panel perspective. They said, you know, put the, um, put the uh, they put the main device uh, that, that kills power to the panel inside the panel in the top right corner or the top left corner, then they put the surge and then they do blah, blah, blah. Well, if I can take that main disconnect and put it outside of the enclosure in its own compartment, then I have compartmentalized the energized. The, when you open up a set of contacts, remember that line side is always energized based upon an upstream uh, what's supplying it. And that, uh, you know, may be in a different area, different room. Uh, and you will have to rely on labeling to know, am I opening the right disconnect? But if you attach the disconnect, take it out of that enclosure, put it on the side of it, right next to it, or a part of it on the compartmentalized. When you open that switch, you can get presence of voltage indicators that are on the market today that are awesome listed solutions. And you can be, uh, be one step closer to establishing an electrically safe work condition so that when that electric worker verifies absence of voltage, they have a higher level of confidence that there is absolutely no voltage there because they've got the visible blades that are up here uh, in in uh, in this switch, or they've got the presence of uh, presence of voltage indicators on here. So Nick's going to talk a little bit more about that, and I want to make sure he shares that information. Common electrical safety hazards: line side voltage. First, our double door safety switch provides workers the ability to replace fuses in a safety switch while the line side voltage remains isolated in the upper compartment behind a separate door. We also released our OLI switch for control panels. The switch moves the disconnect, which historically would be in the control panel, to a separate side mounted enclosure, isolating the voltage to a separate enclosure when work needs to be completed in the control panel. Remember, PPE is critical, but it's designed to minimize the impact of an event that is taking place. By requiring products with additional safety designed into them, you can reduce the risk of the event happening in the first place. For more information. All right. All right. So, so um, I, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't, I don't, I'm not here to give you a commercial. I'm here to help you understand that getting that disconnect outside of that enclosure next to the equipment, it doesn't have to be an industrial control panel. It can be, um, it can be uh, uh, like, say, I, I mean, we were requiring disconnects on motors, et cetera, within line of sight, all that other good stuff. And we, we talked about some of those, uh, those code requirements, but we want to make sure that, uh, that we can provide the, give the provisions to the electrical worker to establish an electrically safe work condition. And a lot of that's going to exceed the national electrical uh, code requirements. Now this next type of solution is something that we install in our facilities. Uh, in, in like our beaver plant, which is up here where we make our multi case circuit breakers, we put this breaker in a box with the arc reduction maintenance switch, which we'll talk about in front of all of our equipment or right next to the equipment that will receive maintenance or possibly justifies, justified energized work. 
Hi, I'm Jordan Ambers here in the Flex Center today to talk about a demo that we have of our arms and closed circuit breaker. The arms and closed circuit breaker uses the breaker technology for reducing arc flash energy when you're doing maintenance on the switch or connected equipment downstream and puts it in a nice, easy to use package where you can easily turn on and off maintenance mode. So to turn on maintenance mode on an arms and closed circuit breaker, you simply turn the padlockable pilot device to the maintenance position and you get this blue indicating light. When the blue indicating light's on, you know that the breaker is in maintenance mode and you have reduced arc flash energy at the equipment and downstream of it. When you're ready to turn it off, you return it to the original position, the light will turn off, and then you're back to the original breaker trip curves that are set for your distribution facility. If you have any questions or need more information about an arms and closed circuit breaker, contact us at flexswitches at eaton.com. Take myself off mute. Uh, I was just looking through some of the comments. Thanks, David. Uh, you're a too kind, buddy. Uh, no, I did not say to eliminate LED lighting. I was saying that if you use LED lighting in some of those locations, you can limit the amount of maintenance and having to get up there to replace lighting that will fail more often. LED lighting will last a long time when installed correctly. Um, so uh, let's see, Bruce, before 820 power pump station sewage lifts came to be, it was posted as recommendations about 30 years ago. At the time, 120 volts was nominal for float switches. All right, so Bruce is sharing some of his knowledge. I agree. I, I, I appreciate that. And, and Tommy's, uh, again, yep, I would love to join Ryan and David, but you probably won't want any of my Canadian money. No, yeah, yeah, no, Neon, don't, don't, uh, don't feel obligated at all. I'm, I'm, I'm not in for the money. That's for daggone sure. Um, and here's another one. Uh, they have a ground fault enclosed. Wow, I don't know about you, but that's loud. Hi, I'm Jordan Ambers with Eaton Switching Device Flex Center. As you can tell, today I'm not in the plant. Instead, I'm in weekend mode at the local marina. The marina might not be the first place where electrical safety comes to mind, but you could be surprised to know that every year in the United States, there are numerous deaths caused by electric shock drowning from leakage currents around marinas where vessels are connected to shore power. The National Electrical Code adopted Article 555.3 in the 2017 code cycle to require 30 milliamp ground fault protection on overcurrent devices feeding marinas or boat yards to better protect swimmers who inadvertently end up in the water around these vessels connected to shore power. Eaton's developed an enclosed circuit breaker offering with factory adjustable 30 milliamp or 100 milliamp ground fault protection depending on the NEC requirements in your local jurisdiction. The Marina ground fault breaker is currently available for single or three phase circuits up to 600 amps. For more information on the Marina Ground Fault and Closed Breaker, contact us at flexswitches at eaton.com. You know, the, um, uh, the, the amount of solutions that are out there, and, and, and the marina is what I, what I like about the marina discussion and the changes that we put in the National Electrical Code in Article 555 is that it demonstrates a layered approach to ground fault protection, which can be used in other areas. You know, this uh, enclosure that we have, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure other people have solutions as well, or you could ask anybody, any manufacturer to make whatever. Um, you know, I'm, I'm partial to Eaton because that's where I live, breathe, and, and, uh, and eat. Uh, those guys are, have, Eaton's been great to me, so um, you can't, uh, can't go wrong with that. Um, they, we've, we've been bringing solutions like this, which provide you can provide layers of protection. And what we did in Marina is we said four to six milliamps at receptacles, 30 milliamps out the vessels, 100 milliamps on all the feeders. It's four to six, 30, 100. And we could employ that type of practice in other applications where you might want to provide a higher level of ground fault protection of equipment. So this is a design decision, safety by design. In my opinion, I can isolate a problem by identifying it before the problem exists or before the problem uh, it, it escalates and, and somebody touches that uh, uh, that equipment that is uh, is energized. So we can, from a safety perspective, 
we can uh, provide a safer insulation by possibly employing some ground fault protection of equipment up through the um, up through the power distribution system uh, higher up into the system and so I'm getting more into uh, em elimination or substitution or some of the controls uh, in engineering controls uh, in either isolating people from the hazards or, or whatnot so that hierarchy of control is is important and and Jim Jim pointed out that uh, that safety triangle you know again it it, it we understand that those close calls that that exist out there uh, will will increase and 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 the more you have of those the probability of you having a fatal injury are pretty high um, what they 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 said that uh, 40 percent of electrical industries involve 250 volts or less so another misperception is that 120 volts is not as dangerous as 480. So that's not necessarily true. From a shock perspective, I don't care if it's 480 or if it's 120. I can kill you with either of those voltages. 208, I can kill you. Uh, hierarchy, again, you know, eliminate, substitute, and engineering controls. We want to be, we want to be in a safety by design world. We want to be in that area. Now, again, we have to understand what work is going to be performed on equipment you know, and 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 when is it going to be justified energized work so we have to understand justified energized work to understand if that would occur on the equipment that I'm installing or I'm designing around and if it does then I want to put certain provisions in for the electrical worker so 130.2 of 70e tells us that um, electrically safe work conditions if we're going to do energized work, you have to be able to prove additional hazards uh, that uh, are present or increased risk for that application. You have to prove that it's infeasible to establish an electrically safe work condition. You have to prove uh, that you are uh, operating less than 50 volts or, you know, that it's a part of the normal operating condition. And, you know, the examples of, uh, of additional hazards or increased risk, they say, uh, you know, you have somebody on life support. You know, now don't ask uh, probably my wife if I'm on life support, if you want to shut something off, but, um, you know, get my word for it. But, uh, you know, if you have somebody on life support, you, obviously you can't kill power to that. Um, if you have an alarm system or, you know, hazardous location ventilation equipment, that those types of things, if you have a process that has to function, that if you turn it off, then that, that if you turn it off, then you can hurt somebody or kill somebody, then that is obviously, you have an increased risk associated with that. And that's a, a reason for justified energized work. Infeasibility, due to the way the operation uh, limitations, uh, diagnostic and testing, it's infeasible to test and, and get do tests of circuits and, um, and do that while it's de-energized, right? So there are some cases where you uh, are definitely going to do justified uh, energized work and and it's really important to understand that that it's going you know it, it's going to occur uh, what equipment what is the work what is the activities and Matt Hussey said this and I wish I had the sound bite but he did say he says you know you have to understand what is the electrical worker going to be doing and from a design engineering perspective our design engineers who work on our motor control centers um, they put into place the um, um, various design parameters or design, um, uh, I guess, uh, what do you call it? Design features inside of our of our motor control center, our arc flasher uh, motor control center. And um, I had the, I thought I had it queued up, but I don't. But I wanted to show you the uh, motor control center uh, my motor control center MCC video. Uh, it's not the quencher. It's not the experience center. Let me just do an MCC. I'm going to search for MCC because, um, oh, no, I know where I put it. I put it in the folder for today's event. I put a bunch of files in there. 
that I'd like to share with all you guys, and um, I'm, I and I'll have links to them in the description. Um, and today is the last day of Shock Week. All right, here we go. Draw not to draw out MCCB. Oh no, I didn't. Dag gummit. All right, well. Let's take a look at, uh, maybe I have it here. Draw breaker integrated, power defense. I'm going to search Eaton. Uh, here's the thing. So uh, we have a videos.eaton.com has, um, has a lot of videos uh, out there. Uh, arc resistant, I think we call it our arc flash guard. Flash guard MCC. Uh, there was a video that was done a while ago, um, and I'm, you know, I'm sure the product line will probably go, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe he's showing that video." Uh, it is out there on YouTube, and there's uh, a lot of cool. Um, Eden designs and manufactures of cool, uh, some of the most versatile and adaptable motor control centers. Here. I'm going to get past the the marketing stuff uh, and get into the meat that because that are prone um, to incidental and minimized opportunities. Hold We've on. featured Eden's arc flash mitigation go. technology on Gear TV before, but FlashGuard seems to be a line that takes it to a whole new level. Definitely. FlashGuard MCC incorporates many of the finest features and innovations that Eaton has introduced in their other arc resistant product lines throughout the year. But you know, in the end, it boils down to two words, prevention and protection. Prevention is a foundation of arc flash safety. And we've addressed that from several different angles in the design of our cabinet interior. For one thing, FlashGuard reduces the possibility of arcing faults that can be triggered from a face-to-face -face or face-to-ground short circuit. We do that by insulating the entire length of the horizontal bus and providing labyrinth barriers that forms a clamshell layer of insulation around the vertical bus. Also, you can see that we have an active interlock system on our FlashGuard unit that prevents the user from extracting the unit from the cabinet whenever the stabs are engaged on the vertical bus, or from reinserting the unit back into the cabinet if the stabs are inadvertently left extended. But in addition, there are two independent shutter mechanisms. One of them can be found inside the MCC cabinet, and it automatically closes whenever a flash guard unit is removed from the cabinet. The other can be found on the flash guard unit itself. This shutter closes whenever the stabs are retracted into the unit. Together, these shutter mechanisms automatically isolate both the vertical bus and the power stabs whenever flash guard units are inserted or removed from the MCC cabinet. Now, these are features intended to reduce the potential for an arc flash event, but we're not assuming that an arc could never happen. Absolutely not because that's the kind of assumption that you just can't afford to make when dealing with the lives and safety of plant personnel. Mm -hmm. And that's why we've designed the flash guard enclosure the way we have. Mm -hmm. For the safety of operational and maintenance personnel, we have designed the cabinet to be the main defense against the harmful effects of an arc flash event. We have very substantial steel panels and doors that when securely latched can suppress and contain the energy of an arc flash explosion. In essence, they form a barrier of protection between you and the potential danger that can be generated by an arc flash event. In addition, we have designed FlashCard MCC okay. with through-the-door controls, as well as visual indicators that allow plant personnel to operate the motor control center without ever having to open the enclosure door, as well as run and stop push buttons but you know, in the end, mm -hmm. somebody is going to have to open up the enclosure door to perform routine maintenance or for troubleshooting. Right. But with FlashCard MCC, there will never be any surprises when you go inside. For example, with conventional MCCs, the door must be open in order to use a multimeter to perform a test before touch procedure to make sure that the bucket is de-energized. But sometimes the multimeter probes themselves can accidentally touch off an arc fault flash event if the bucket is still live. But with FlashGuard MCC, there are visual indicators that let you verify that the bucket is de-energized from outside the enclosure. And it lets you decide beforehand whether it's safe to open the door or not. In addition, each FlashGuard unit features Eaton's proprietary roll-to-track mechanism 
which enables the power stabs to be retracted within the unit. This allows flash guard units to be safely disconnected or reconnected to the vertical bus with the cabinet door closed. An optional remote racking system extends the operator's safety zone to a maximum of 15 feet while disconnecting or reconnecting the unit power stabs to the vertical bus during bucket replacement. Available panel accessories also include the voltage vision module, which flashes to indicate the presence of dangerous voltages inside the unit. And the motor guard. So this was in 2011. And here we are in 2020. You know, Matt uh, Hussey conveyed the fact that, you know, we've, we've had a lot of these technologies out for quite some time. And, and that product is just getting better. And there are other manufacturers with similar products now. So there are a lot of solutions on the market that are not code required. They have to be specified and included in the design. So it's important to remember that um, safety by design is a decision that's made in the design process. And sometimes, I mean, if you did not order, if you did not specify uh, these types of solutions, it's not like you can come in after the fact and say, hey, you know what, I want to upgrade to that. That, that. That's very difficult, very expensive after the fact. There are certain things you can do from an upgrade perspective, but you want to get this stuff in the design phase of the, of the power distribution system uh, in, in your design. I'm just trying to see if there was anything else that uh, that uh, he was saying in here on how, um, but the, I was I, I was just very, I, I I thought it was very important to, you know, again I'll have links to that you can watch all of that and that just gives you more um, awareness of solutions and that why, that's why we educate ourselves that's why you you get vendors to come in and tell them uh, to to tell you here's the latest I have to offer here's what I can. I was uh, I went to visit a consulting engineer one time and I was going to I forget what what the topic was and he looked at me and he said look don't um, don't uh, don't come in here to tell me how to do do this or do that he says I, I that's what I do for a living tell me how you can make my life easier or how I can do that better uh, and then we talked about solutions but um, but in any case you know be mindful of the solutions that are on the market because that's an important part of, uh, of, the safety, uh, of the safety by design message. So understand the capabilities and options in, uh, in the electrical equipment. Uh, so my blog, I have a, a safety blog that, um, uh, that is somewhere here. Well, let's do this. Um, I'm just gonna, we'll, 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 we'll find it uh, together. So if you um, if you search for Eaton for safety sake, there's a for safety sake's bl uh, blog that um, has a you know again I I contribute. We started this uh, a while ago. Uh, I've since then we've gotten as many other people within our organization out uh, posting uh, information. But I have a safety through design uh, blog on here. Uh, safety by design, actually, I believe it was called. So if we do this, let's do this. Let's make this safety, safety by design. Hopefully I spelt it right. Safety by design, safety by design. Uh, that's actually... EHS Today, I'll take a look at that one for us. OSHA, let's take a look at what this one is because I believe that's probably my article. Nope, that's Mike Bolster. How about Eaton, Safety by Design? Safety Solutions. Featured blog, cybersecurity, that's another big one. Fault current product cybersecurity standards. Creating a safer installation, defining reconditioned equipment, surge protection, 
man, I didn't realize there's a lot of lead equivalent for safety. I did that one a while ago. Uh, that is an effort that goes above and beyond bare minimum requirements. Uh, but up, but up, but up. Hold on with me here. Um, Resiliency-based standards. Oh. I think I clicked on something. Yeah, this is my safety by design uh, document. All right. You can sign up for that blog. Uh, creating safer conditions for electrical workers and protecting equipment through safety by design. So eliminating the hazards, implementing designs that reduce the likelihood of the hazards from occurring, reducing the potential severity. That's another aspect of safety by design is you may know something, you know, on shock, I can't reduce the severity. I mean, you're going to get shocked. You're going to get electrocuted. You're going to get electrocuted. We already said I can't like lower the voltage to 120. Now I can get it below 50 volts. You know, you'll get the tingle type of thing, um, but that, that might be one way to, to, to reduce that uh, impact. Um, I have eliminate the hazard, hazard elimination. Uh, so I talk a little bit about hazard elimination. I have designing for reduction of likelihood. So uh, I, I identify that your electrical one-line diagram is a critical piece of the electrical safety p uh, feature. You know, and it's not something, the, the one-line diagram is not... Um, it's not like you say, hey, you got to know new products or things of that nature. Having an updated one-line diagram helps the electrical worker determine what they need to turn off to be able to establish an electrically safe work condition. If I did not elect to put a safety disconnect switch right next to the equipment that they were going to have to do justified energized work or that they're going to have to work on to reduce the... Um, to, to, to establish an electrically safe work condition, if I didn't put a safety disconnect switch right there, then they've got to go somewhere else in the facility, determine what to turn off and lock and tag out. And it might be that there's a complex lock and tag out procedure they need to follow. And that will put them into all of the other different types of pieces of equipment. Having an accurate one-line diagram is critical. And I tell contractors all the time, that is something that if you have, uh, if you have one of your customers a good, valuable, uh, a good, valuable deliverable that you could have for them is to make sure that you keep their one-line diagrams updated. Help them understand why it is critical for you to keep those one-line diagrams up to date. Um, just going to look and see if there's any questions out here on YouTube. See what's going on YouTube. I stepped away. Uh, please click on that 21 watch out. Only seven likes. Yeah, I got seven likes. 21 watch. Thanks, Tom, for another great series of webinars. Thank you, John Clements. Uh, you're on. Great. I'm glad you got on. Um, just signed up for the blog. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so, and I talk about barriers. I talk about disconnects. I talk about visibility. Uh, you know, oh, lighting. Uh, lighting in and around the areas of, that you are going to do electrical work on my panel board over here. I, uh, I put one of those fluorescent lights over top of the panel board uh, and it is powered separately uh, from some of those. Uh, I know what exactly I need to have on in that panel to keep that light on. Um, what else? Uh, visibility indicators. Uh, oh, 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 visibility. So, making sure those lights are not on presence. Uh, what do they call those? Um, motion present type of things. Um, indicators, uh, you know, presence of voltage indicators, making yourself aware if you are providing equipment, if you're the design engineer and you've elected to go with Eden for whatever that project is. And let's say that they have on-site personnel well, they may have maintenance personnel or they could just have uh, security personnel or whatnot. We can do educational. The manufacturer of that product, of those products that are installed, can do educational uh, awareness on the, some of the features and functions and benefits of the solutions that were installed. And sometimes it could be that, hey, you know, it's a panel board. Uh, there's not much to it. It's, you know, these are circuit breakers. 
but here's what you should and shouldn't do, and here's how you do maintenance on this equipment. We can do that education with the owner themselves and their team uh, or the contractors that are going to be working on that equipment. We can do education. We can get them down to the plant uh, where we're making the products and help them understand. You know, we have satellite plants across the U.S. that w- we make the products close to where they will uh, where they'll end up being. Uh, knowledgeable information and then workspace. You know, you're not going to buy workspace from me. I may be able to sell you products that are smaller. I may be able to sell you products that will go up against the wall. Or like Matt Hussey said, he can put motor control centers back to back. And that may help you leverage the room in that fa- in that facility. But I'm not going to sell space. You're going to have to work with the architect and argue for your space. Uh, that's sometimes the hardest thing. Um. All right, just signed up for the blog. All right, do I put disconnects? I'm just looking. Hopefully, I didn't uh, miss some comments up there from uh, John Clements. Thanks for joining us, Bruce and and crew. We got a lot. Of Tommy Davis is out there. I mean, just look at the lineup. I mean, we've the the individuals who are online right now are are are, are just awesome. Uh, Ab Abdul Magid Magi. Uh, glad that you found me. I'm not sure what was going on with the Eventbrite link. Uh, apologize for that. Um, all right. So, uh, and then designing for reduced and severity. So increasing the clearing times, increased clearing times, or decreasing clearing times is what you really want to do. And what I mean by that is you want to, uh, A, provide a disconnect. Like we talked about the, the arcs in a box, the arc reduction uh, maintenance switch. Uh, for that uh, multi K circuit breaker in a box uh, that we put in front of equipment. Th- our goal is if you have to do justifies and en- justified energized work, then we're, we we want to make sure that the arc flash, the incident energy in that equipment is not very high. And how we do that is by uh, providing a fast clearing time in, in that equipment. Um, and, and so as an example for that, uh, if you look at the, the trip curves for mold decay circuit breakers versus power circuit breakers uh, versus insulated case circuit breakers. So this is a 600 amp mold decay circuit breaker. If I can get that breaker to operate within 0.012 cycles, I'm at point, I'm less than a calorie, right? That's uh, 0.64 calories. I'm in gloves. The, the uh, arc flash boundary is probably inches. So I'm in a pair of gloves. Obviously, I'm wearing my my glasses, and uh, I don't need a balaclava. Um, I'm I don't need uh, a lot of other personal protective equipment because I'm at a very low incident energy. The moment you start adding time, now you are in. I went from 0.6 to 12 calories. That's a big difference. Uh, I went from 0.01 something 0.16 seconds. Um, you know, a cycle to um, to uh, twelve point seven cycles, almost ten cycles, and I went to twelve over twelve calories, almost thirteen calories. Uh, that's a healthy uh, a healthy event. And if I did a power circuit breaker, a six hundred amp power circuit breaker, I'm into the over thirty calories. Uh, and if and if and if I'm on the secondary of a transformer, I am probably in uh, in, in a much worse uh, situation. Uh, because of the location in the power distribution system. And we went over this in one of my other classes a few weeks ago. Uh, remember, we had a 225 kVA transformer where uh, with 4% impedance, I laid out sort of laid out the circuit for us, and I had 23 uh, calories per centimeter squared because I'm relying on th- I'm relying on the upstream overcurrent protective device, because in this box, I have to assume line side propagation. And, and I have to assume that if I have a, a, an arcing event in this enclosure, it's going to propagate to this line side of that main breaker. And now I'm only relying for a clearing time on the primary breaker. If I add that disconnect, just pull the main breaker out, put a disconnect in front of the equipment. And this goes for that whole, what Nick Kluse was talking about, Nick Kluse was talking about, with regard to that safety disconnect switch right next to the equipment. 
and 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 this is a uh, a circuit breaker. I'm I'm going to show you what the fuse will do for you as well. But if I simply move that out and I'm working in this equipment, say doing justified energized work, and let's say that you know I'm showing a panel board, but that could very well be an industrial control panel. I'm relying on this overcurrent protective device, and now my incident energy is less than a half of a calorie. I went from 23.5 to 0.34 simply by relocating the overcurrent protective device. That is not a code requirement. That is a design decision. That can be specified. And if I specify a fusible disconnect switch, I can take it down even to a, and, and this is a conservative number because you know why? I'm not taking advantage of the current limitation of that fuse. I just simply used 0.01 seconds as a clearing time in my SKM arc flash analysis. So I modeled this in SKM, uh, put the transformer in, put the impedance in, uh, and redesigned this. And these numbers are basically uh, based upon the 2018 version of IEEE Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers 1584. And that's a four, not a nine. So simply moving and putting a safety disconnect switch in front of that panel board or whatever that is. It could be an industrial control panel. That could be a motor. It could be um, it could be an elevator control panel. I don't care what it is. HVAC control panel. I put an AC disconnect in front of it. As, uh, as long as my fault current is high enough, obviously, whether it be a circuit breaker or a fuse, uh, I'd want to, I'm sizing that fuse now not to protect the conductor. I'm sizing that fuse to let whatever it is operate in that piece of equipment provide a local disconnect for the, uh, for the application so that if I'm going to work in this piece of equipment and that switch is right next to it, then I can simply pull that handle and then test for my absence of voltage, lock and tag that out, all that good stuff. Establish an electrically safe work condition is very easy. If I'm going to do justified energized work, measuring voltages, things of that nature, if I cause an event, I'm not going to be seeing 23.5 calories. I'm only going to see uh, probably a much less than 0.25 calories. And then what uh, one of the things that we did was we uh, created what we call the breaker integrated transformer. It's the B I T. Um, and I have, uh, I have that right over here as well. Uh, I believe that's right here. If I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is the breaker inter integrated transformer. And uh, it goes up to 300 kVA. Uh, that's what it looks like. The breaker is, uh, is integrated with the front of the device. I think that's a stainless steel one. Uh, there's a, a standard gray uh, type of uh, <laughs> uh, picture on it. Hopefully, I'm showing that picture right now. I just, uh, hopefully, my stream deck is working. Yep, it does look like it's working. So, um, this uh, this solution basically, and, and you know, there's some uh, information out here, some videos that helps you understand Again, we have a transformer flex center. We've got safety disconnect switch. Uh, they, they'll paint this transformer any color you want it. We'll make it red, white, and blue. If you live in Italy, we'll make it uh, your Italian colors. If you're in Croatia, we'll make your colors. We can put whatever whatever color you want to make that transformer. We can make it blend. We can make it disappear. Um, oops, sorry about that. Uh, so, And we can add uh, the connectors and quick connects on them. Uh, there's a lot of different things that uh, that are, are possible with those uh, types of transformers. And you may have a lot of different designs necessary for your application. You may need a specific impedance transformer. We can design those and bring those to you, as do many manufacturers out there. It's not just a an eaten thing, although, um, you know, can't get much better. But in any case, um, uh there's a lot of different white papers. There's design guides, et cetera, out there for that solution. Um, but in any case, this is a, uh, this is a uh, uh, breaker integrated transformer, puts that secondary breaker in there to make this type of performance a goal and something very achievable. Uh, in specifying 
uh, putting locks on these on the circuit breakers, uh, even where it's not required. You know, putting that uh, that that fixed in place lock access accessory on these devices will promote the use of lockout tag out. Um, there's our safety switch design guide. We already talked about that. We talked about all the different. I'm going to put all of these links down below in my YouTube uh, channel as well. And uh, remember, too, that um, I have a resource for you out on my LinkedIn site. So if you're not connected with me on LinkedIn, please connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm building some references for your use. I have a shock and uh, shock reference. Look at that shock and dash references for your library. I guess I, I put the and in there because there's probably more. Um, but I I have, uh, uh, again, and there, there's a link to the For Safety's Sake blog as well. Commonly used statistics, um, electrocutions associated with consumer products, worker safety. I have below the links uh, for other articles, electrocutions on farms, uh, agriculture. If there's anybody out there that's designing agriculture stuff, you know, there is... Um, research that shows that uh, there are a lot of uh, deaths in and around farms and a lot of electrocutions. Every year, 62 farm workers in the United States are killed by electrocution. In 91, two Iowa farm workers were killed and two others were injured in accidents involving electricity. Uh, portable grain augers, uh, oversized wagons, large combines. There's a lot of uh, outside lines that are too low. Uh, there's a shock just from, uh, you know, a failure of equipment in and around. There's, uh, I know there were cases where they had, uh, you know, uh, hosing down areas inside of uh, barns and whatnot. Uh, you have wet locations, damp locations. Um, and again, uh, but, but I have a lot of the resources in, in those areas. Uh, we have electrocution hazards on the farm. Iowa State University, they're doing a lot of research on this. And this was a while ago. I haven't, I haven't done some more research on uh, on this. This was what 2017, so not all that long ago. But they um, they talk about the overhead power, electrocution hazards, uh, seasonal types of things, standby generators, all that. So there's there's references here, and if you have references, you say, hey, here's an interesting one. Uh, send it to me. I'm going to throw it on here as uh, as one repository for your resource resources to understand some of the hazards you might be designing an agricultural building. If you don't understand some of the hazards in that building, you may not know that you could possibly leverage in agriculture where they, the concern in ag is that um, nuisance stripping of GSCIs at four to six milliamps. Well, you can layer on, do what we did in marinas, put that 100 milliamps or 30 milliamps in various areas further up in the distribution system so you can identify problems when they exist before somebody comes in contact with them and then provide um, a GFCI protection. Look at this. Boy, uh, dies from an RV. This is an interesting one. Um, uh, and there's, you know, panel seven, co-making panel seven keeps pushing back on, oh, this is actually a YouTube video. Uh, Want to sell online? Go to Wix.com today and do it like this guy. Skip it. Hello, Chris Doherty here, technical editor for the RV Travel Channel, and I'm joined by RV contributor and electrical engineer Mike Sokol. Mike, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Mike, we've got some unfortunate uh, news here uh, that just came off the wire. Uh, according to the Lee County Sheriff from Amboy, Illinois, uh, three-year-old Landon Gerald Keener was uh, unfortunately electrocuted, and it looks like he was electrocuted from the skin of an RV. You've been following this story up a little bit. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about it. Yes, from what we know, it appears that he was electrocuted by what we call a hot skin condition. And this occurs in an RV when something's happened to its wiring system or grounding system. And the skin of the RV itself now has an elevated voltage on it could be 40 volts, could be 120 volts. What makes that dangerous is if you're standing on the grass or damp earth and you touch any part, any metal part of the RV. So that you can watch the whole thing by going out to this and, and um, simply coming down through here. There's, uh, you know, there was a lot of dialogue in around 
RVs. Uh, there's a electrocuted after trying to save uh, his dad and the dog in Putin Bay Marina. So there's another marina. Uh, electrocution while swimming. So all of that. Uh, and then there's the body resistance uh, review. It's another uh, information on those. So we've and I see David Engelhardt's down there. He's already uh, visited that one as well. So uh, don't forget to take a, a step out and look at, at those resources that I have for all of you, uh, especially as we move into um, into increasing safety and in design. You have to understand in your design, understand the hazards that are that could possibly be in that location design some things into the system to help reduce the likelihood of someone. You're never going to take and remove any chance of somebody dying in and around any location, but you can work to reduce the likelihood. Uh, maintenance is another big uh, area of concern. Uh, and it's important to understand that uh, there are uh, options available for, um, uh, you know, understanding what is available on the various technologies that are out there. And uh, we have a whole new line of circuit breakers and there's, uh, there's uh, technologies on the market that can help you understand when do you need to pull maintenance, right? I know that um, there was a, a design, I believe it was copy machines. Copy machines, <clears throat> at one point, you know, they, they'll fail. I mean, inevitably, you've got somebody in there working on the copy machine or, or the printers, right? Um, but we're all digital these days. But in any case, they had technologies built in those printers and those copy machines that would notify somebody uh, wirelessly from, um, uh, you know, the whoever had the contract for that facility that they had to go in and change some toner or that it's malfunctioning and they have an alarm alarm and they can go in and work on it. So there are ways that, and solutions on the market that will uh, enable you to uh, understand more and more and more about the electrical distribution equipment. This is a, a review of uh, some new technologies that we have on the market uh, from an Eaton perspective that helps the electrical uh, installation uh, understand what's going on with their overcurrent protective devices. They have uh, embedded uh, communications. There's ways to have remote indication, whether it be a hardwire or through, uh, you know, Modbus or one of those other technologies to be able to share uh, critical information that says, here's what happened. Here's why it happened. It provides your, your, your typical protection that circuit breakers are supposed to provide but you're going to get more out of these new devices that are on the markets today where it'll tell you, Hey, you know what? I've seen, uh, I've seen, uh, I don't know, uh, X amount of faults that are up close to my interrupting rating. And you know, you should do maintenance. Uh, you should come out and visit, uh, visit this installation and, um, and, uh, and, 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 uh, pull annual maintenance on me and it might be more frequent because of the the number of times that it, it has interrupted faults um, uh, so they we call it uh, predictive uh, uh, predictive or breaker health circuit breaker health is what uh, is basically what that is so there are a lot of different uh, new technologies uh, on the market that will give you additional uh, information as to the condition of maintenance of the electrical uh, distribution equipment. There is what we call the drawout. So we take, um, e, uh, where is it here? This is, that's the switch. We've got um, power defense electronic. That's the trip. We've got a, a drawout molded case circuit breaker. And what this is, is basically you, uh, we took the, the whole concept of uh, MCCs and whatnot, and we um, implemented that into a uh, switchboard where you have multi case circuit breakers that you can rack off of the bus uh, through the uh, through the enclosure so and remotely so you can this cartridge so to speak comes off of the bus and all of this is finger safe inside and uh, you can easily take that breaker out take it and do some maintenance take that one out put another one in uh, in its place while you perform maintenance on that so there are a lot of solutions on the market that um, that are not code requirements. That's the key. It's not a code requirement. It is a design decision. 
And when you understand the operating characteristics of these of these devices, you know it's a mechanical type device that needs to be cycled every now and then. It has uh, contacts inside that don't last forever if you keep beating it with faults. Uh, there are arc uh, extinguishers inside that will um, that will help work to uh, remove the uh, the the arc and uh, extinguish the arc and conquer and separate and conquer to conquer and divide it and all of that stuff works together through magnetic fields and and whatnot to um to uh um, to interrupt the fault currents whether it be an overload current or a fault current like a short circuit or a ground fault your your these mechanical devices are doing all of this work uh, but again it doesn't do it all the time forever without you um without you uh, um, having to pull maintenance on it. So it's really important to understand the limitations and capabilities of all of the equipment that you are installing. And if you can pick technologies that will um, provide, for example, circuit breaker health, uh, like, the, like these circuit breakers do, we have uh, predictive diagnostics equipment that will help identify bus failures and other things in the in the um, in the system. So I'm just looking at the time right now. My wife went over Carla's house, so she's uh, out having fun in um, in the sun, which everybody on this phone on this uh, call should be doing, and will be doing in a few minutes. So breaker health is an important uh, aspect of electrical safety. Um, and, and safety by design is all about picking the right solutions. All right. Uh, here's another, and you know, again, another solution, uh, on the market available that, um, you would have to specify, you know, presence of voltage indicators. Uh, this is the VeriSafe absence, absence of voltage tester, um, that tells you when you've disconnected something, it, it's, uh, it's, see, doesn't see voltage there is a you know, nice green glow that it has. Uh, that shows you how it's wired, and Matt Hussey talked about this. Look, there's redundant connections to each of those uh, terminations. Uh, very important to uh, design these things into uh, and, and specify them uh, in your design. Uh, specifying these windows for thermography, uh, that's not something that's a code requirement. It's going to be safety by design. It's up to the design engineer. It's up to the uh, design build contractor. It's up to the electrical professional who's going to be selecting or telling somebody what they want to tell them to get some of these options that will increase safety. All right. We were up to 25 people now. Uh, 25 uh, safety conscious people just out there Spending time with Tom Dimitrovich and the rest. We got John Clements. Um, it says, many great electricians who have taught me so many things, including safety. When the experienced electricians are doing things the safe way, the young ones usually. That is exactly right, John. Very important that, and I think the electrical engineers, the electrical contractors and electricians, people in our trade coming in to the business today, are much different better, and probably better off from a safety perspective than years ago. Because what happened years ago, it was we pushed those limits. We came from a mentality of uh, here, hold my beer while I, while I do this. Or, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're not a man if you can't do this type of deal. Um, and, and we accepted risk. And then that translates all the way down the stream. Now we're in an, an environment and a world of safety conscious professionals who are handing that down. So our young guys coming into the business today are getting, uh, are getting drilled into them the whole concept of NFPA 70E. They are, I think, even more and more aware of uh, the National Electrical Code. Uh, and we are our own worst enemies uh, by doing things energized. You know, Jimmy told me one time, he says, you know, uh, there are so many ways that we hurt ourselves in our industry because uh, that one contractor or those contractors will say, you know, I'm not going to work energized. But the other guy down the street says, oh, yeah, I'll do that. No problem. I'll put my guys at risk. Right. 
um, accepting that level of risk. And the more we uh, just decide to do and we accommodate uh, unjustified electrical work, the, the, the worse that we are actually being um, f- uh, to our electrical industry. We're not, uh, we're not doing ourselves any justice um, by, um, by uh, performing unjustified energized work. We don't need to do, if we don't need to do just uh, electrical work energized, then just don't do it. Um, but we'll continue that process, right? Um, uh, put, let's see, um, what else? John Clements. I appreciate John Clements. I appreciate Bruce. Uh, <laughs> Bruce, yeah, I love you, man. Bruce, click that thumbs up. So easy to do. Like it. If you, I, I, I really appreciate that, Bruce. I'm new at this. Um, I know you get no takers. Uh, I, I'm new at this, uh, I'm new at this whole YouTube thing. I've only been doing it for a few months and I've been more focused on uh, getting information out there than uh, trying to figure out the YouTube thing. And uh, so I appreciate, uh, I appreciate those who are much more familiar with the YouTube world than I am. Uh, Don Ganeer says, are you saying we can't teach them how to check voltage with their fingers? Oh, you know what, Don? Twice in my, more than twice. Um, I had an electrician who, um, I might, I have, I even have the picture of the receptacle. In fact, on my Facebook site, uh, I'm going to close a couple things here. I put the Menti code for those want that, uh, who, who are just want to get it the heck out of here. But on my Facebook site, I have a, um, I created a site called found electrical problems and, um, I'm going to show, uh, I can't, I'm going to, how I, how do I do this to get the Menti code in? This is one with me and the guest. So I think I can do this. Um, Cause the guest right now is <laughs> my monitor too. That's what it says monitor too. But on my Facebook site, I have a thing called found electrical problems. And there's a picture, uh, which is on the title side of that, uh, of that. And and I started this a while ago. There's a lot of followers out there. I haven't put, po- I haven't been posting a lot to it. I don't know if anybody out there is, has, has seen this, uh, this site before and when my slow computer comes up. Uh, but the cover, the, the main picture up here at the top, which you're going to see over here as soon as it uh, pops up is a picture of a receptacle. I went into a distributor location when I was out and about, uh, you know, traveling the world, uh, teaching and whatnot. Uh, And I went to a facility and that is the picture right there. You see how the, the front of the receptacle came off and the whole faceplate and everything just fell off. And so I'm looking at this and I, and it was a little step type of deal. And it was like, there was like a little stage area. So I, I was standing in front of it. Somebody walked up and it just, it, nobody touched it. It just fell off. The whole front of the receptacle fell off. So I, I told somebody, I said, Hey, I said, you got, uh, that's exposed. That's 120 volts. I mean, uh, exposed. Somebody needs to, to address that. So they called their electrician. He walked out, no lie. And he started unscrewing that receptacle. And I said, whoa, what are you doing? I said, he goes, well, I'm, I'm going to replace this. He had a new one in his hand. I said, well, you should, uh, aren't you going to kill power to that? I think it's energized. I'm thinking, well, maybe he turned it off before he came. And he goes, yeah, it's energized. He says, but um, I've done this a million times. And I'm like, well, no, no, not, not while I'm standing here. You know, I, you know, I, I grabbed, I, 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 I grabbed somebody else. I said, you know, there was, I said, go, go get somebody because, this is ungood. And he, he, he didn't, he didn't call me anything, but he, he commented about me. And then, um, he started to, uh, take that receptacle out. And sure enough, man, he caused a ton of sparks in that receptacle because his screwdriver slipped and he went right in on that 120 volt. I mean, it was like a, 
and um and he jumped back and then uh he never said a word. He walked away. He put a he put, moved over and put a chair in front of it, and then he walked away, and then he came back, and he went and killed the breaker and shut the breaker off. Uh, and then he he didn't he didn't even test it the second time. I mean, he didn't do a test. And, and uh, I'm telling you, I watched stuff like that, and I know everybody out there has watched it too. We've probably done stuff like that. Don't do that. Um, but that you know, I, I and you, if you, I don't know if you. Uh, you know, go out. I haven't, I haven't posted to it. I think anybody can post to it. Um, I've, uh, I've uh, posted some uh, found electrical problems uh, uh, to this, uh, to this site. Um, every time I, whenever I see issues out in the field or, or whatnot, I try to copy up some pictures. You know, I, I love this one. I used, uh, I used this one in my, uh, in one of my presentations for working space. Uh, you know, uh, I was in a grocery store and, you know, that was the panel board. It was, uh, it was completely, I mean, there were pop camp, uh, pop bottles and whatnot stacked in front of it. Um, Bruce B, not too many, but last to uh, how many of those old finger checkers are still around? Yeah. You know, here's some of the picture. Oh, I love this one. You're going to love this. I was coming, driving back from St. Louis, Missouri. And this is down off the exit of Interstate 70 and Route 7 in West, in Ohio, uh, just on the other side of the river from, um, was it not Morgantown? It's, um, oh, I can't, I can't think of the name. It's right where 70 goes through West Virginia. And <laughs> I looked up and I saw there's an extension cord that comes out of this window. It's draped over that air conditioning unit. And goes into that window. And look at the sign on the bottom. It's a law firm of all things. I'm like, you can't make this up. I loved it. I had to take a picture of that. Spotted that little gem. That was in 2017. Um, that that was just priceless, in my opinion. It was priceless. Um, that building, I think, right now is torn down. They, they eventually tore it down. Or one of these two buildings is torn down. But... I, you just can't make this stuff up. All right, Dawn, I appreciate everybody dialing in. Check out some of the resources I have for you online. Hopefully this was helpful to you. Uh, have a great 4th of July weekend. Go enjoy yourself. I will have a beer on you, uh, um, uh, Mr. David and uh, David Engelhart and uh, you too, Ryan Jackson. God bless both of you. God bless everybody out there. Thank you very much for, for tuning in. You've got the uh, sound, uh, sign out uh, menti code down below. Uh, thanks for joining me on your holiday, on my holiday. Um, and stay safe this weekend. Stay safe always and healthy. Practice your social distancing network. And don't forget to wear your masks. Put them on, keep safe, and uh, be a part of the uh, social distancing network. Nihad El Sharif, thank you, and everybody else who's joined us. 21 viewers out there, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for joining. And Steve Froming, stay out of trouble and stay out of the Wisconsin R&R Ranch, okay? No more of that. Come on. Stop. All right, brother. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to sign out um, for today. And um, it's been fun. It's been real. And it's been real fun. So God bless. Stay safe. Take care. Signing off for today. I'll be looking for, I was talking to Larry Air. We're probably going to do that um, fire pump controllers and Article 700 systems hopefully next week. If I can set up the date, uh, maybe the week after, I don't know. Stay tuned for that. All right. Take care. I need to somehow stop projecting. How do I do that? Where's the link? There it is. All right. Adios. Arrivederci. Bonsoir. Good night.